Well, happy spooky season, everybody. Uh, my favorite time of the year has come again, and we're going to be doing a ton of episodes in the next coming month and kicking us off. We are doing the best uh, content geared towards kids that are spooky or essentially spooky films and content that we all grew up with. And that was come up with our lovely uh, two timer guest, Charlotte. Um, thank you for bringing such an incredible idea to the table. I really appreciate it. Um, and we have two first time guests that I'm really happy to bring to the pod. I love their takes and I love their uh, taste in films, basically. Uh, Ant-Man and Rigby, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Super stoked. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. Me too. Me too. Likewise. And Charlotte, like, how did you come up with... Well, we did do Kino children's films a few weeks ago um but what it like what do scary kids films mean to you on a personal level i guess well growing up i was very much a spooky goth kid and stuff and halloween is like right next to my birthday and i feel like when you're born in october you sort of get stuck with like having halloween parties as your birthday party and stuff and so like you're indoctrinated to love it from a very early age and also like i grew up in the late 90s which i feel like were like that pinnacle time of you know spooky children's media whether it be goosebumps scooby-doo um etc and then halloween you know it's a children's holiday at heart it's you know really interesting to look at from a sociological level of children being able to go to neighbors houses and demand candy and it's just a great time absolutely it's truly a holiday i've never aged out of which is why i think this list is gonna be really special to all of us because it kind of reflects where we were as kids but also you know what how it's still meaningful to us in this day and age because like i I look back on, you know, growing up in the Midwest and the leaves changing and, and you know, drinking apple cider, um, <laughs> eating a ton of candy and just watching. Um, and man, you had mentioned this, you know, watching stuff that we weren't necessarily meant to be watching. Um, so like, what was your, I guess, what was you, you and Rigby, like, what was your line of thinking when you're coming up with this list? You know, like, was it pure nostalgia or was it like a bit of both? Um, For me, it was kind of both. I try to sum it up as like, like, what was I watching within reason as a child that molded me into the human that I am today? And I tried to also keep it uh, to some choices that maybe would still be acceptable to show my, my son when he gets a little bit older today. I don't know if I'm going to stick to that, but we'll see. <laughs> um, but that's where my head was at. Something that made me into like the horror-loving Kino dude as I am today love it rigby how about you yeah i think for me truly like i guess children's horror and then kind of graduating into you know like b horror and true like 80s horror really uh kind of molded and catapulted my love for cinema as a whole so like you know a few of these films i'm going to talk about are so pivotal in my childhood and kind of teenage years where i was like you know, it to me, it wasn't just watching a movie. It was like truly something I knew was like going to be a passion and I loved. So, I mean, my my film really kind of journey started with this genre. So they're really important to me. I feel the exact same way. Um, it was I'm not going to bring it up, but like seeing Halloween and Friday the 13th um, when I was like 12 or 13, that was like what catapulted my love for films and you know leading to like exploitation stuff and more like i guess esoteric horror films and it's, that's kind of like the obsession that's first started so you know it all stems back to i think what we're going to talk about today in some respects so i can't wait to hear what you guys bring up um and i guess let's just get into it and so charlotte since this was your idea how about you kick us off with your first movie or show i should say that we did expand the rules a little bit normally we don't talk about tv on these lists but i th we we kind of said fuck it we're going to talk about like miniseries and tv shows and other you know franchises i guess so 
Yeah, not go ahead. Spooky kids media, not spooky Just, kids movies. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> My first pick is a um, American mashup of a German cartoon because apparently that was like a really popular thing for Americans to do in like the eighties and nineties, were to take like foreign cartoons and like condense them into like movies for VHS and. Um, this is a German series called The Ketchup Vampires um, that I was, like, fucking obsessed with when I was, like, three. Um, it's just, like, a really, really fun time. It's narrated by Elvira. It's about a troop of vampires who are basically um, hiding from their family because they don't enjoy drinking blood like the rest of vampires, and so they're sort of ostracized from vampire society but they drink ketchup ergo ketchup vampires and it's stupid it's probably not good it's all here on or not it's it's not all here on youtube the sequel movie is on youtube and it's a fun time amazing i've never heard of that i haven't that's either that's yeah it does mm -hmm. always so leave it to charlotte to like come up with some like <laughs> wild stuff never even heard of that i immediately have to add to my list of shit to watch I was originally not going to include it because it is so obscure, but then I thought I should include it because it is so obscure. No one else is going to have heard of it, and I want it to be more popular because I want it to come out on DVD one day. Mm. Is it streaming anywhere right now? It's not streaming anywhere. Um, I think really the only way you can get your hands on it is like by buying a VHS and stuff or like watching like really bad quality YouTube some, yeah, YouTube rips yeah mm -hmm. sounds worth it because that sounds like a really interested plot I guess yours it's a German language you said or is it like a hybrid it was originally in German and like there's like a whole German TV series with like a bunch of episodes but what I grew up watching and what I know is on YouTube is like this english language dub that is again like you know just a bunch of mashups of like like shortcuts of like the tv series condensed mm -hmm. into like a little probably like 45 hour and a half movie type thing and again it's narrated by elvira so you can't go wrong there oh no way wow <laughs> incredible um great pick to start us off you know i love I love esoteric shit like that that no one's heard of. So mm -hmm. you make us look more hipster than we actually are on the Cinnabum. So thank you. <laughs> um, I'll go next. Um, I'll just say right up front. None of mine are very obscure. Um, I never I never went as deep as Charlotte has gone, I don't think. Um, although I'd like to. Um, so mine are pretty mainstream. Um, um, but I will kick us off with joe dante's masterpiece from 1984 gremlins which is one of the great cinematic achievements in the history of film i, I would like to say as is gremlins too um joe dante is just a genius um i think um not only with the practicals and just the the perfect sort of childlike tone that he injects into a lot of his movies like you know that small soldiers so many um it's like the balancing act of just balancing tones of just like super adults, but also kid friendly aspects. Um, you know, like you're, you, you see the movie through the eyes of, of kids in that film and it's super relatable, but at the same time, it's so absurd. And um, Howie Mandel's voice acting as, as uh, the gremlins is so fantastic. Um, I just have so many fond memories. Like uh, I think, Officially, this movie is actually a Christmas movie because it takes place during Christmas. But just popping this in so many times during the spooky season was I had so much fun, you know, watching this with, like with my friends and with my siblings and everything. Um, I just I'm just a huge Joe Dante fan, and I, I adore the the Gremlins movies. Do you guys have any Gremlins uh, adoration out there? Oh, dude, that was that was one of mine on the list. I, I scratched that off. I actually Fuck. had two. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no worries. I actually had two life-size gremlins. Uh, those like giant ass Neko props. They're since gone because they just collected dust, and like, they were cool to look at for a couple years. But yeah, I absolutely adore gremlins. I mm -hmm. would fucking kill to 
ever see like the rated R script because like, Gremlins yeah. is supposed to be gnarly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, my... The reason they invented the PG thirteen rating. Gremlins was part of it, right? It was instrumental yeah. in the rating system changing, which makes a ton of sense. Yeah. My dad actually, when I was a kid, used to call me Mogwai because of Gremlins. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> but yeah, that's also very much more of a, a Christmas film for me than like something I watch in October. I mean, watch it year round, but definitely more so at Christmas because it, it is a Christmas mm-hmm. movie. Agreed. I agree. Um, I also I like... oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I was I just about to this here would be happy with Jack Skellington's version of Christmas. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's definitely. Another, yeah. That's that's why I didn't. Yeah, I would have hard trouble with that one too because I watch that every Christmas. But I was just about to say, Phoebe Cates um, delivers one of the best slash worst monologues in the history of film when she talks about her dead father. <laughs> um, I, I I laugh every time. Every time I think about that scene, it's just so funny. Uh, just a horrible monologue, but I would not have it any other way. Um, so eighties, so eighties, oh so eighties. Yeah. Three year old me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is traumatizing. But at, as an adult, it just makes me laugh. Like, mm-hmm. That's when I realized there's no Santa Claus. <laughs> like, no, what? <laughs> um, yeah, I love, Joe Dante is the best. But anyhow, oh, yeah. uh, and man, do you want to go next? Yeah, actually, um, I'll I'll loop it right back around to Joe Dante again. Um, he, he's one of a few directors attached to this film, but. Uh, the Twilight Zone, the movie, um, that's definitely one that really, I grew up watching the Twilight Zone and there's certain scenes in the Twilight Zone movie that just completely horrified me as a kid, but it was still PG. So I got to watch it. Um, Dan Aykroyd in the beginning, like you want to see something really scary. Of course, that terrified the shit out of me. Uh, The big old, like, I don't even like Jack in the Box bunny thing. Like, I don't mm. know if I don't know if you remember that, um, but the Twilight Zone has always been something like super special to me. Um, I love like old school, like fifties and sixties, like sci-fi, and you know, granted, it may not be like the best effects out there, but the stories around them were pretty cool. Um, and as I got older and I started researching like the making of the Twilight Zone movie, that in itself is a horror movie. That would be a really cool documentary if somebody were to ever uh, want to do that. Wink, wink. But yeah, um, definitely that's something instrumental that kind of started to get me, like segued me into, you know, from watching I don't know, Power Rangers and shit like that when I was a kid to like, there's something else out there and it doesn't necessarily always have to be super scary. Um, and it also gave me that that sense of uh, less is more, you know, like um, the the creature of 20,000 feet, you know, there's something on the plane, something, you know, you don't really get to see exactly what that thing is, but like just some yeah. shadows, but your brain is just like going crazy thinking like, Oh shit, that thing probably has fangs and you know, it's <laughs> super gnarly, but yeah, definitely twilight zone, the movie, man. That's, that's one that doesn't really get talked on enough. Um, yeah. Even though it's a popular, popular film. Sorry, I'm a cat. Uh, doesn't get talked off, talked off about enough. That's yeah. the one with the uh, the cursed films uh, helicopter incident, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> John Landis incident. Yeah. yeah, yeah, dude, and it's it's absolutely insane, like how that happened, and essentially nothing happened after that. Like, sure, uh-huh. like there's some rules and stuff like that were were put into place, but it's like. Yeah, dude, you just had a helicopter decapitate a guy and a kid, like. But it's okay. Keep filming. Like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the eighties, crazy you know, special. Time. Coked out eighties were a time. <laughs> I'm glad you you mentioned the airplane segment. The I think it's the George Miller one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that one freaked me the fuck out when I was younger. Hell um, yeah, made me scared to fly like <laughs> for a long time. Um. <laughs> But uh, the Joe Dante segment, too, is, is so fantastic, especially for kids, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, the whole cartoon segment is really, really fun. Um, do you have a favorite episode of Twilight Zone in general, like aside from the film? Um, well, 
I'm going back and I'm rewatching a lot of the episodes because my band actually utilizes like the Twilight Zone as like reference point for a lot of our music. So one of the ones that I I had watched recently, um, these I don't remember the name of the, the of the episode, but these two guys they're going to Mars. Uh, they crash land on Mars, and one of them is the pilot is dying, and he's like, "We got to get out, and we got to go like see what's out here." And the other guy's like, "No, I don't want to. Hell no!" And he's like, "No, like just trust me. Everything is going to be fine. Like, uh, uh, you know, the, you never know what's going to be on the other side. They could be very helpful people. They could be just like us." So the guy dies, and sure enough, like finally the pilot, the co-pilot, goes to leave, and there's individuals that look just like him, like humans and stuff like that. They talk in English. Um, he gets all excited. He's like, okay, cool. Everything's like, he was right. You know, I'm saved. I'm, I'm saved. Everything's going to be great. And he goes to sleep inside of his spaceship. Cause they tell him we're going to build something for you. And when he comes out, um, they show him this house and it was built to spec. on like what, what they think a human house would look like. And he's super excited about it. He's like, dude, this, this feels just like home. And he goes to open up the window and it's still just brick. And he's like, what the hell is going on? And it turns out the aliens were building him a prison for him to stay in. And they, he was essentially an exhibit, like an animal exhibit for the Martians to just stare at. And it shows like a little wow. plaque and it's like, yeah, here is human, blah, 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 blah. And he's just stuck there forever all by himself in his little house made prison. Shit. So, yeah, I love it. <laughs> That's, that sounds wonderful. Yeah terrifying uh, yeah yeah absolutely terrifying um uh rigby you are next what's your number okay. five um so i wouldn't so all of the films or pieces of media that i'm going to talk about i don't think i've really ranked them I'm just kind of going to go off of feelings i guess um so i'm going to start with one that's like a really really special film to me um, it's actually a short film, um, and it's really special because I only watch it maybe once or twice a year, and it's only when I'm feeling, like, really, really down and really, really upset. I save it for those moments. And it is uh, Tim Burton's short film called Vincent. Um, it was one of his first, if not his first, um, stop-motion animation film, Um it's in black and white and it's essentially um, narrated by Vincent Price, um, who I know was a massive influence um, on Tim Burton. And when Tim Burton was a kid, like he loved watching old Vincent Price films. So um, there's a little boy in the film and his name is Vincent and he kind of thinks he's like Vincent Price or Edgar Allan Poe. And it's so stunning. It's only, Gosh, I think it's only about 16 minutes long, but um, yeah, all stop motion animation, all narrated by Vincent Price. Um, the music is so beautiful. And just for some reason, when I saw that as a kid, like it really catapulted my love for Tim Burton, um, which also then kind of catapulted love for Vincent Price, which, you know, exploring Vincent Price films just opened up a whole new door for me in terms of not only horror, but just, you know, old films in general. Um, and I love it so much. It's so special. Like I said, I only watch it like during those moments when I'm really, really down and it, it, it is very kind of melancholic. Uh, it kind of has the same ending as um, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven which if you know the ending of that, you know it's not a great ending. Um, but for some reason, it's just so comforting for me. Um, I feel like, Charlotte, you probably have seen this before. No, I, I totally get that vibe, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Tim Burton, definitely another filmmaker that's brought me a lot of Halloween comfort over the years, too. Um Oddly enough, like it's, it's like Edward Scissorhands and Batman Returns are like movies that I come to the back to the most just repeatedly around spooky season. But I, I definitely want to check that short out. I love Vincent Price a lot, too. Mm -hmm. um, it's on YouTube. Just search Vincent Tim Burton. 
Absolutely. Um, and I love how you said that it was like your window into Vincent Price because like watching Ed Wood and like Bella Lugosi, like that was a, a, a door to like all new like classic B movies and like just seeing what he was all about. Like uh, Tim Burton is such a like formative filmmaker, mm-hmm. I feel like for a lot of people at a young age. So, yeah, I feel yeah. like there'll be a few Burton films today, but he's truly mm-hmm. just he is the epitome of spooky kids media. Like you can't get any more like on the nose a hundred percent yeah um charlotte do you want to go next yeah sure 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 so my next thing that i'm going to is sort of like the opposite end of obscurity i don't feel like you could be a human being without hearing about (laughs) (laughs) scooby-doo which i feel like you know sort of is like the um what is the word the beginning of um spooky kids media for real for real if you want to like get down to it um yeah like it just sort of created this entire genre that we all know and love of that sort of thing specifically i want to focus on um scooby-doo and zombie island which is you know yes i think most people sort of agree is like the best of the scooby-doo franchise and it's just like a legitimately good horror film while staying within the confines of um being a children's film as well um the music is great it's terror time again i think is like such a bop that we can all get down (laughs) to um it actually wasn't my favorite as a kid because you know I'm more of a hex girl obsessor with um, <laughs> the witch's ghost. Um, but growing up, you know, you can just tell that the quality of Zombie Island is better. And it also, like, opens up conversations about stuff like colonialism and shit like that, too, which is really mm-hmm. interesting. Totally. Mm-hmm. Damn. Charlotte also goes very, you go very deep. Like, I wouldn't. <laughs> Like I, I, I don't know. I don't. I never thought of like it, introducing like colonialism or any of that stuff. I just when I was a kid, I just I remember watching it because I'm like, oh, zombie, zombie. I can get away with watching this as a kid, and like nobody's gonna tell me no. Right. And the Louisiana setting is so like you know just classic Southern Gothic horror, and it just does a really good job, I think, of embodying that, you know, vibe. Ridby will be able to, you know, talk more on that than I would. But Yeah, I mean, I'm not Louisiana born and bred, and I don't know if I'm necessarily a fan of Louisiana anymore, so I'll keep my mouth <laughs> shut. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, I, I love that movie so much. Um, and, like, even just the TV show and everything and and even very much love the 2002 Matthew Lillard one movie a lot. Oh, um, yes. It's very, very good. Um, the perfect live action adaptations, I think. Both of them are great. I love both yeah. of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love the, the casting in the 2002 one. I think they just got, like, down perfectly. Like, just mm-hmm. to fit the tone of, like an early 2000s adaptation of Scooby-Doo is so perfect. Um, an early James Gunn script, I think, too, interestingly enough. but um, Naming Shaggy's girlfriend Mary Jane is just... <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Matthew Lillard, one of our greatest uh, people ever. Um, treasure. Such a treasure. Uh, I'm Okay, I'm going to stick with, you know, kids very, very... Uh, geared towards kids media right here because this is something I watched probably since I was like an infant and I watch every year um, exactly on October 31st every year Um, and that's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown uh, which I was very much drenched with Charles Schultz and that whole you know comic strip sort of thing for my dad at a very young age um, that's like the earliest media I could really remember being exposed to, not just the the films, you know, like the Christmas, the Easter one, and Valentine's Day one, but also just reading the comic strips as a kid, seeing sort of the illustrations and just 
fallen in love with the style like when I was like really really young um but my favorite thing he's ever written is definitely the great pumpkin one I think he captures the childlike innocence of Halloween and sort of that magical feeling that it is kind of bestowed to all of us when Halloween comes around and that like that kind of point of perspective of all the different kids you know Linus is very much you know looking to see the great pumpkin and he has this like willful willful ignorance about the whole holiday and everything Charlie Brown is getting rocks left and right when he's trick-or-treating um, which always you know I always felt very empathetic towards, but also laughed my ass off as a kid, like so much. Um, and there's like this whole segment where Snoopy is like fighting in this like mock World War II sort of situation on his doghouse. And it's like one of the most like striking animation I've ever seen, ever put to film. It's so beautiful. Um, and it's just got everything in like 25 minute, you know, exquisite, you know, perfectly paced package. It's one of the best. Uh, cartoons that that's Halloween themed that I could personally think of, and I I just love Charles Schultz so much. I love the music, of course, um, and yeah, it's just it's just so iconic. I love it. I got a rock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm gonna admit, I have never seen that. <gasps> what? I no, I know, I know. I don't know why. I just I've never seen it, and it's I feel like blasphemous saying that. Being on here, but yeah, well, it. no, it's no not. better it's time. A... Yeah, yeah. To rectify that, yeah. Classic Americana. I yeah. think, um, yeah, yeah I did, like when I was a kid, I spent you know a decent chunk of my childhood in England, and I don't think um, like mm. Snoopy or anything is is very popular there. Um, so that kind of plays into it as well. I've never really watched any sort of Charlie Brown or anything like mm. that damn yeah i get that but i think you would love great pumpkin especially um it's just so beautiful um and yeah i've i've met a lot of other people my age that never grew up with it's very much a thing that it's like either drenched and like forced upon you as a kid or else you discover it as an adult sort of thing so mm. i totally i totally understand that um uh, but yeah that's that was my my second pick so and man you're next all right so again keeping to the theme of something that still sticks with me to this day and i'm not going to say that this is a great movie by any means because honestly going back and rewatching it now it probably isn't but i feel like i can remember every single scene in this film that scared the shit out of me when i was a kid still to this day and that is going to be 1990s arachnophobia. Oh yes, uh, got uh, <laughs> some some Jeff Daniels, John Goodman, uh, goodness. I still to this day, I'm terrified of spiders. I hate them, you know. And it was a toss up between this and Jaws because I I hate the ocean just as much as I hate spiders because of that. Um, but arachnophobia, that scene towards the end when it started going crazy and you see spiders coming out of people's popcorn and stuff like that. Yes. Um, when I was a kid, the end of my street, it used to be open field. And, you know, there, it'd be funny. There's times you'd walk outside and there's a cow just walking straight up the street. And uh, they were doing construction. So a lot of like the, the critters over there, like uh, spiders and snakes and all that stuff, just got pushed into our neighborhood. And we started seeing a lot of sp- like tarantulas and scorpions and stuff like that. Um, wow. So that Jeez. like on top of just being obsessed with watching this movie that used to terrify the shit out of me uh, together. I just, I don't like spiders. Even looking at them on a movie, I get like goosebumps. I don't like it. I will watch it. Uh, but yeah, that that's ingrained in me and that I don't ever see that going away. I will be an arachnophobic till I'm dead. Hey, I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have thought the opposite. <laughs> oh, I, I, I like cartoon spiders, like, like cartoon drawn mm. spiders and like the typical, like, family-friendly Halloween spooky sp- spider decorations. I like that. But any sort of like realism, you lost me. Nope. Wow. <laughs> it's like Charlotte's Web's okay. Yeah, Charlotte's Web's fine. Although, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> There's some gray areas with that yeah. one too, for sure. 
Uh, John Goodman's incredible in that movie too. That absolutely he, incredible. He's an American treasure. He needs to be protected at all costs. Anything he's in, <laughs> yeah. he's just fantastic. Even if the movie around him or the show around him is garbage, he has just always mm. been spot on and amazing. One hundred percent. One one of my favorites to ever do it for sure. Hell yeah. Um. Great pick. Uh, Rigby. Okay. Um. I'm going to go with something maybe a little unhinged for a second. (laughs) I Um, love love it. Let's go. And um, separating the art from the artist for a second here. But um, I have to say that Michael Jackson's Thriller music video directed by John Landis, like a massive staple for just Halloween and music video history in general like i don't think anything before that you know came out that was remotely even the same and fucking terrifying um and i am gonna expose myself for a second here because um when i was little i was a massive michael jackson fan um and i loved this music video so much that um i was him for Halloween. Oh. <laughs> um, wow. My mom actually made me that jacket. She's an amazing seamstress. Um, and she spent months making me his exact thriller jacket. Um, and I, I just love it. Like, I knew the dance. Like, the song is just incredible still. Probably, like, one of the most popular songs ever to exist. Um, just the, the practical effects and the makeup in it as well of the zombies. Like... It's just amazing. And and that also opened up the door for John Landis for me because, uh, you know, American Werewolf in London. Um, mm. He has a, a massive book out that's called like Monsters in the Movies. And I remember I made my mom buy me that book. Um, so, yeah, another kind of gateway piece of media um, that is just, you know, it's it's suitable for children, I guess, if we're, if we're staying that course and just fun and spooky essential. So, yeah, Thriller music video. <laughs> Dude, so good. Uh, yeah, I feel like, th- honestly, Thriller, um, when it came out, it catapulted horror into, like, a different realm. I think it I think it actually brought it onto, like, a, a different light other than just, like, oh, just campy, shitty films and stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the amount of love that it received, you know, uh, outstanding. Uh, and, yeah, I... I don't want to say that horror wouldn't be the same as it would as is now if thriller hadn't come out because it, it probably would, but the the acceptance uh, in in a time where there was a lot of questionable films coming out like seems like every other week, you know uh, that coming out and having everybody like damn like there's actually some real merit to this. It's mm-hmm. not just some random thrown together. There's some thought behind this. It's well choreographed. Uh, you know who the hell is John Landis now? Let's let's take a look at this. Like I think I think it was awesome when that when Thriller came out. Another one narrated by Vincent Price as well. Right, yeah. Rip. Yeah, yeah you know. absolutely. I feel like it also elevated just the idea of mu- just music videos in general, you know, and mm-hmm. inspired a generation of directors that came out later. David Fincher and I believe Tim Burton, you know, who worked on just very gothic kind of like tones with like really big artists, you know, Madonna and all these people. Um, mm-hmm. it actually made me think of Prince's Purple Rain, which is another not a horror themed one at all, but like just kind of this collaboration with an artist and and a director to create something very striking and really memorable. And I love that sort of stuff. So definitely agree, dude. Yeah, good job thinking outside the box too, because I never would have thought of that. But that's a really good pick. Um, okay, Charlotte, <laughs> you are up next. My friend. Sticking with Hanna Barbera, my um third choice is um 1993's The Halloween Tree, which is this great made-for-TV animated movie. Wow. It's a um buildings roman about a um troop of trick or treaters who um their friend is um in the hospital with an appendicitis and stuff and. They go on this journey through Halloween's past and um, in an attempt to um, save him. And it's just a really great 
introduction to the um, historical facets of Halloween and where different things, different Halloween archetypes like the witches and the mummies and skeletons and stuff like that come from while still being entertaining and not like, you know, here is historical fat thrown in your face and stuff. It's a wonderful animated film that I love a lot. It's based off of the Ray Bradbury book, who is mm. one of the kings of horror and stuff. Um, and it's narrated by him, which is really neat. Sweet. Yeah. Did you Damn. all have a favorite Halloween costume as a kid to sort of go off of that? I think mine's the, the Michael Jackson one. <laughs> 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 That's a good one. I got to think about that for one sec um uh, damn okay so i would have a toss-up between just cra classic dracula uh I, I remember i was like maybe five years old and that's when they started coming out with like those little blood capsules that you can chew on and i remember oh, i yes. chewed on it yes. and i looked at myself in the mirror and i just started crying and i thought that was, <laughs> like, i look back now i'm like damn that sucks but um <laughs> that and then one year because i've always been obsessed with the terminator one year my mom made me like an endoskeleton costume um that's amazing and yeah like i i put that thing on and i didn't ever want to take it off i even tried to wear it to school multiple times my mom was like dude stop you put it away <laughs> halloween is coming sooner or later I'm like sooner rather than later please. Oh, man. <laughs> for me it was i think it was i, I was neo from the matrix one year having not seen the matrix because i was <laughs> six years old i just loved the leather outfits and <laughs> the sunglasses a lot as a kid um but also being ghost face i remember me and all my friends when we were in fifth grade also i had just seen scream and i was obsessed with it we all planned to dress up as ghost face and just scare all the kids in our class basically the entire day so I have like a really fond memory with that. Um, unfortunately, I never really had my parents like crafting costumes for me. They're not very, I guess, industrious like that. So I'd always just go to the party city or whatever and just pick out something like on the wall and stuff, which was, again, one of my favorite things to do in October is just like go to Halloween stores and just browse stuff. like. Do you guys ever do that? So I oh, still yeah. do it to this day. <laughs> uh, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> Spare Halloween? Are you kidding? Yes, Spirit. <laughs> Party City's kind of gone down a little bit, but I'll still go mm -hmm. just in case. But yeah, when 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 I start seeing that Spirit Halloweens are opening up in my area, I'm in the car and I'm driving around. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. That oh, was Charlotte, a... you're you're muted again, my. Shit. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Can you hear me mm -hmm. now? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I'll just hold this right here when I talk. Um. <laughs> It's where half of my house decor comes from is what I was saying. <laughs> Hell yeah. Look at Daps. That's amazing. That was um, a massive part of my childhood was spare Halloween. And I think like when I was like 9, 10, 11, um, I remember me and I was friends with these two twin boys. And it was like the one day of the year that we just like looked forward to like with such ferocity and like going in there, it was like, it's different now that I'm older. I don't know if it's gotten like worse or I'm just older, but I remember as a kid, we were just like, it was like an amusement park. Like, it was just yes. the, the best time. And we were just so excited to go, like not even buy anything, just look. Just like look it was in. just so fun. It was just such like an amazing childhood core memory. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's all like, the oh, go ahead, dude. I'm sorry. I was going to say all the props too. Just mm. like you mentioned the fake blood and like the vampire teeth and everything. It just, yeah. yeah go ahead though. It was just so no, fun to look. I just like, I remember distinctly because growing up we were, pr we were pretty damn poor. So like a lot of the stuff that I had was like, uh, like homemade or handmade for my mom, but we would go window shop and Halloween stores all the time. And I have this distinct memory of just like, picking up halloween masks and smelling them because like certain mm. kinds there's just that smell and I, it's so mm. hard to describe because you mm. you rarely get them now i don't know what they're made out of now yeah. but yeah i would go around and I'd pick them up and i'd smell them like oh 
it's time. <laughs> <laughs> God, that is such a distinct yeah. smell. It's like that latex, like yeah, yeah. yeah. Michael like Myers sweet. mask had like a just very uh, that was like the cleanest one always to me. <laughs> oh yeah, like I always just know like oh the furry ones they smell a little more <laughs> dingy than the other ones. It's, God, I, I I'm definitely gonna go like hit up a Halloween uh or whatever whatever they're called um spirited i could go hit one of those up right after this if i can um i'll go next um so uh, charlotte just talked about a really obscure pick of course i'm I'm gonna bring you guys to one of the most popular forms of media in existence um which is the simpsons um but i grew up watching the treehouse of horror uh anthologies like very very religiously oh here we go charlotte's got a prop (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's incredible. Um, obviously The Shining uh uh and Dawn of the Dead and all all the amazing homages are really great, but I want to highlight the ones from season 5 <clears throat> where basically the storylines are is when Homer sells his soul for a donut, <laughs> which was is one of the funniest log lines I've ever seen in The Simpsons. Um the, the other storyline is uh, Bart was on the bus. It's, it's actually similar to the George Miller um, uh, anthology that we were just talking about where he sees a little gremlin on the side of the bus and only he can see it. And it's sort of tearing out like all like the the engine parts and everything. And, and basically it's like their impending doom just seen from Bart's POV. Um, and then Mr. Burns is, as Count Dracula, which like it was only a matter, matter of time before they did that. Um, but I, that was my favorite, but I kind of just wanted to highlight the whole notion as a whole that they would just take some time out of each season to craft like a very elaborate and hilarious, um, anthology series. Um, and that kind of got me into like horror anthologies later on, like body bags, creep show tales from the hood, just some of the greatest horror anthologies, um, and I became obsessed with that whole notion because of The Simpsons, funny enough. Um, and just some of the greatest horror satire, I think, ever ever written, in my opinion, are from those episodes. Um, but do you have you guys seen any of those by chance? Any of the Treehouse of Horror ones? Oh, yeah. I used to watch them religiously. Um, I've gotten away. I don't know. Do they still? I know Simpsons is still around. Do they still do the Treehouse of Horror every year? I think so. Those are like the only ones I continued watching like post season 20 or whatever. So <laughs> to see what they what they spoof, you know, in modern culture is still pretty fun. Yeah, that's another one that like, uh, again, it, because it had such a massive platform, it was really cool seeing like all the homages to probably what other people would think of as like niche horror films. You know, the, the, now there's this big platform that's like, yo, check this out. Um, if you're a curious and, and smart kid, you know, you're going to take that and run with it. And before the days of the internet, you know, it was, it was a little harder, but once the internet came around, you could search everything up. And, but yeah, yeah, Treehouse of Horror is awesome. My uh, parents, weirdly enough, didn't let me watch The Simpsons as a kid. They were like very against it. Um, and weirdly enough, though, they bought me this book and i want to say it was like third grade and again this is such a staple in my mind as well it was like this uh book of just like the simpsons treehouse of horror um and i remember i would always flip through it and i I distinctly remember like the aliens and then like Mm -hmm. um there was like different versions of like bart all like creepy I, i i i watched i've seen it but in my like adult life i never watched it as a kid but i remember them buying me that and it, i was just like obsessed with that book it was like third grade as well that's so cool gotta get my hands on that yeah Charlotte... I, can't remember, I can't remember what it's called but it was cool yeah that's that sounds amazing charlie have you seen any of them i'm assuming so you have the the model <laughs> house of horror it's one of my favorite you know childhood Halloween memories is waiting for the Simpson episode to premiere on like Fox on Sunday. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, always a great time. Absolutely. I'm so glad you guys are all have some connection to it for sure. And I remember I I was renting them. I would go to Blockbuster and they would have the marquees for Halloween. Um, and I was a massive Simpsons fan already at a very young age. And I would see like a very striking cover of like 
Maggie with devil horns and like Homer Simpson. Homer is like with an axe, like kind of resembling Jack Torrance. I'm like, what the hell is this? And I would just rent it and like rewatch it like 10 times before I had to return it. It was just so many great memories of, you know, um, which actually brings me up another thing. Like, did you guys, uh, were you guys video store nerds? Were you guys renting all these things too? Like, yeah. you know, oh, these things yes. we're talking about. Yeah. I lived at Blockbuster when I like, so when I was a kid, I didn't really have a lot of friends because I was kind of antisocial and just weird. So film quickly became my like best friend. And once like, my mom signed off that I can rent whatever I wanted as long as it wasn't like a, I don't know, like a adult movie or something like that. Uh, I went straight to the, to the horror section. I'm like, cool. I'm going to start at a, and I'm renting everything and I'm watching whatever I can get my hands on. Mm-hmm. I, I miss those days. Cause now with streaming, it's so hard. You, you, you have so much at your fingertips and you start to read something. It's like, Oh, I want to watch this. And you start to watch and you're like, damn, but there's something else that I, like I wanted to watch. <laughs> And when you were a kid and you were going through a video store, you just went and you picked up the cover and you didn't read it. You just, damn, this cover looks really cool. All right, I rented it. And now this this is what you're guaranteed to watch. You're committed to this. Yes. I, I miss that so much. Mm-hmm. Me too, yeah. man. So much. I uh, privilegedly grew up an only child. So when we went to Blockbuster, it was always my pick. Um, <laughs> I won't say the two films... That I always picked every single time because someone might bring it up, both of them up in this episode, but there was always two, without a doubt, always in rotation at Blockbuster. Love we that. I grew up without cable, so um, until I was like 10, I want to say, is when we got cable, maybe. Um, and so we lived at Blockbuster, and I lived in like their dollar bin type thingies where you could like you know buy used VHS, which is how I found a lot of the obscure shit that I've been talking yeah. about today. Cool. Yeah, Love that's that. so great. Yeah. Do you guys ever have Hollywood videos ever? Because I had one directly across from my neighborhood, and like walking there, get it like buying a bunch of candy and like renting it out. Uh, just they had like a three for one deal like every friday i think or something like that and yep that would be your weekend you know like that's your you're committed to watching one a day or whatever so i just god i miss it so much when i was a kid like we we were a hollywood video family at first uh because blockbuster was just too expensive exactly Um, and i always like they were directly across the street from each other so we'd walk in a hollywood video and i just look out the window at blockbuster like maybe one maybe one day (laughs) yeah but i will say like when it came to horror, uh, I feel like Hollywood Video like branched out a lot more than Blockbuster did, and in, in terms of like the random obscure shit that you probably would never see on a on a shelf, exactly, Hollywood yeah. Video is really on point with it. Y'all remember any specific um, VHS like covers that just terrified you as a kid? The dentist who brace yourself. <laughs> fucking dude terrified the shit out of me i would i wouldn't even look at it when i was a kid that's just nope walk past (laughs) these done yeah charlotte i know you asked this yesterday but for me it was it Uh, like seeing pennywise i I literally remember telling myself as a kid like seeing the cover and then i saw like tiny snippets on tv and remember saying like i will never watch this movie like i will never watch it like it's too scary and now like it's my favorite book of all time and i love i love the miniseries but mm-hmm. yeah that one really scared me as a kid i was like <laughs> right rightfully so yeah for me it was the ring um also because there was this major lore around my family that it's like the scariest movie of all time and then you just see samara's face completely covered up in this distorted image like I think gave me a few nightmares at a very young age. Um, and, and, and when I watched the movie, like that's all I could think about was like, I'm waiting for that scene that's on the cover. Um, so that, that's what comes to mind for me. Do you have one, Charlotte? Yeah. The Jack Frost yeah. lithograph. VHS. <laughs> oh my <laughs> yes. gosh. I think specifically because like, you know, there's like also the children's movie Jack Frost. And so like for a second, like, you know, you're like, Oh, it's that one. And then it's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's a go is scary. The bait and switch where you think mm-hmm. it's a kid's movie. Then it's like a fucking nightmare. Um, <laughs> 
Um, sorry to derail. I know you're up next, Ant Man, but no. I, I I had to talk about video stores if we're doing this sort of episode of. So. I I will talk about video stores and horror movies and whatever like until I can't talk anymore. So that's not a big deal at all, man. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Um, the next one I'm gonna bring out. It comes with a caveat. It is going to be as standard as it can be. Um, and, I, and I do got to say, there was two families of horror back in the 60s, the Monsters and the Adams Family. Now, when it comes to the show, the Monsters all day, all night, the tattoo that I'm working on right now is cartoon characters of the Monsters. It goes all the way up my arm. I love them. Back there, I have a... Um, all the cast of the monsters autograph whenever like a couple years ago, I got to meet Butch Patrick and Pat priest. And that was like the only time aside from meeting John Carpenter, where I was like starstruck to the point where like I was crying because wow. that, that, that just was my childhood. But with that being said, the Adams family, I think delivered film wise, the most like iconic like representation. And it, it's crazy. Cause like you look at, you look at um, Raul Julia, you know, as Gomez Adams. Technically, that's not how that character looks in, in the, 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 the the comic reels and in that stuff. But fuck, I can't think about Gomez without thinking of Raul Julia. So I have to put Adam's family. I love them both, but the yeah. first one, fuck. Like, that was my childhood. I remember, like, ABC would do, like, 13 Days of Halloween or whatever, and, like, if I saw on the TV guide that Adam's family was on, like, my ass is, is there 10 minutes before I started. I wasn't missing it. I watched – I had a, eventually got a VHS of it, and I wore – I watched it so many times I wore the tape out. Like, it just – it broke. It stopped working. <laughs> I think um, aesthetically, that film, it just – it speaks to me. Like, that's exactly – I would totally love to live in that house. Like, Yes. The, this, this oh, specifically yeah. the 90s version like i would love to live in that house um i would love to have that as my family you know i, I would be honored to have you know <laughs> fucking uh you know cousin it being being like somebody related to me or you know lurch being like a, a, a you know a, a family bill well, whatever he is like i would say he's a family friend <laughs> but he's technically the butler um there's and I wanted when I was a kid so badly to like have a, a, a part of my house where like I pulled a book down and like a bookcase would just go around and there's like a secret room full of all these like golden trinkets, just like in the film. It never happened. But yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's because again, I, when I was a kid, I, I grew up watching the monsters. That was basically my babysitter. I'd hear the theme and I'd come run and I'd sit down and I'd watch it um, over and over and over. And I think, the 1990s Adams family was the first time that I even realizing that I could like both the monsters and the Adams family together. Um, yeah, I, that's one I still, I still visit to this day. Like every, every year I have to watch it. At least the first one. I love them both, but have to watch the first one. Christopher Lloyd, like, Oh my God, dude. It's just amazing. It's basic, but it's, it's great. <laughs> Basic, but an phenomenal vital pick. Yeah, that was one of my blockbuster in rotation movies every I feel, time. I feel like I know the other one. <laughs> we'll see if it comes up. I'll, I'll mention it. But yeah, right. I agree. That was. I mean, for me, like I also when I was a kid didn't have a ton of friends, and I was also like an only child, so I was just very alone majority of my childhood and when i was a kid i thought the adams family was like this super obscure movie that like no one had seen and i was i thought it was just like this little treasure like i loved it so much especially christopher lloyd like uncle fester is forever my favorite adams family character like he's so so great in that and same like i wished like that was my family and the house i i love i love the adams family like you said both are amazing I can't decide honestly which one I like more. Maybe, maybe the first one, but they're both like in my eyes just on par. Yeah, I, I, I love the second one too, like values, because I always had this obsession, and still to this day with summer camp. I love like if yeah, it's if exactly. it's summer camp horror film, I'm all about it. I always wanted to go to summer camp. So like that film, I got the best of both worlds. I got my spooky family, and I got summer camp. Great. 
Awesome. I was about to say the same yeah. thing. Yeah, I was about to say Joan Cusack as Debbie in the second one is like one of my favorite characters of all time. So it's values I, I might like more, but I feel like the first one might fit the mold of appealing towards kids more for what you were saying and like more of just an evenly balanced, you know, tonal movie. Um, I love, yeah, they're both so good though. Um, I was going to ask you, like, did you like the Rob Zombie Monsters film that came out last year? Genu- I didn't see it, but I'm genuinely Fuck, curious. Dude. Okay. So like, I really want to like it and there are aspects of it that I do enjoy and I do get, a monster's vibe when I'm watching certain scenes of it. But I don't know. I feel like the majority of that film missed the mark and Mm -hmm. you can really see the fact that like the budget was incredibly low. Like, and that's not to say that the monsters TV show had a massive budget because it didn't. That's why they, most of the episodes took place inside the home or like a singular location outside of the home. But yeah, I'm not going to lie and say that like, I didn't have like, a little bit of feeling that like my childhood was just shit on just like a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I enjoyed it. I thought it looked incredible with like the colors. I mean, the plot was dog shit. Uh, And Sherry Moon Zombie, she's always dog shit, but I do love Rob Zombie. I will champion Rob Zombie and I hate when people shit on him because I think people who shit on him completely miss the point of his yes. films and what yeah. he's trying to portray. Um, I will say though, I didn't grow up like a, a big monsters fan. So that's why I might, you know, enjoy it a little more than you, but I just thought it was, it was fun and it looked like the colors. It just looked awesome. Visually. Um, yeah. Like it was very vibrant. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to say that I hate Rob. I don't hate Rob zombie at all. I, I, I like his music. I grew up listening to Rob zombie. Yeah. Um, you know, House of Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects. Oh, fuck it, I'll even throw uh, Three from Hell in there to an extent. Um, mm-hmm. Love those films. I'm not the hugest fan of his Halloween films, but I can appreciate like it's that's such a that's such a hard one to do. Like you have something that's so iconic, and you have to get so you, he got told he has to reboot this. Great, but it has to stick with said formula. And but you're still trying to be that artistic, uh, you know, and push your own like creative views on it. I get it. You know, H2 really lost me, but um, mm-hmm. the Lords of Salem, I fucking love the Lords of Salem. I will champion that amazing film. film. I die. It yeah. is so good. I think he doing that film, I think he definitely went a massive step up in terms of like filmmaking. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He just showed a lot of restraint with the camera on that one too, which is really cool. Most of the stuff it wasn't handheld; it was actually yeah. like on a tripod, and yeah, yeah it was so fucking good. Really um, well crafted, like visually, like yes, almost Kubrickian level of like visuals, like really beautiful. Oh yeah, and Sherry Moon Zombie was surprisingly fucking great in that <laughs> film. Uh, blew me away. I was like, all right, yeah. oh, outstanding. But, she's yeah. good when she's calibrated and not like given complete rain to do whatever the fuck she wants as much as i love her in devil's rejects and and three from hell to some extent um i think lords of salem's by far her best uh best work quick story about h2 um that was you know we we, we mentioned blockbuster and i remember i i would host a lot of the you know slumber parties you know sleepovers as a kid and kind of force my friends to watch these weird horror movies that i'd find on the blockbuster shelves and I rented H2 once, and one of my friends got traumatized so badly that his mom called my house like a week later or whatever and kind of complained like, my son <laughs> hasn't slept all week. He's been afraid to go to bed. All he could see is that Michael Myers mask and like, because it's such a gory, <laughs> you know, like existentially dark movie. Um, And yeah, I, I just, I always laugh about that when I wa- rewatch it, the that movie <laughs> kind of a mess and how it traumatized the kids so badly oh um, i i love the first one honestly like i love kind of the the michael backstory mm-hmm. you know, the lore is great yeah. and he's like he's so fucking massive in that film and mm-hmm. so brutal and in a weird like kink way i'm like <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, yeah. um i love it i i love the first one yeah the second one not so much, but 
I think the first one is great. I prefer oh, two, actually. I prefer the second one personally. I know that's wow. that's a steamy, weird take, but <laughs> I I don't know something about it, like the the dream sequences and everything, and I feel like visually just like really interesting stuff. But well, you grew up with it too, you know. <laughs> yeah. So films it you has, grow up with, you're gonna yeah, love. it's got a fond place in my heart, you know. <laughs> I will I say, like Rob Zombie is that you know he's just gonna have fun like and i feel like those are like the filmmakers that i connect most with are like filmmakers who are doing it more for them than anyone else you know Absolutely. exactly yeah yeah i think choosing to cast tyler main as as michael myers was was a great choice because michael myers and all the other halloween films it was never this like hulking person it was a kind of like a standard sized individual maybe just a little bit taller than like laurie strode or somebody but sure. never like this massive human being and so the first time you see him on screen as adult michael myers when he's in you know he's in the the mental institution with the the, the his mask on and stuff like that handcuffed next to mm-hmm. danny trejo like that size difference too <laughs> it's like fuck that guy is massive dude okay I, that seems scary to me and yeah. how they made him very very brutal um yeah that was definitely like a good way to go i i'll, I'll rewatch h2 like i haven't seen it since since it came out in theater so i'll give it a rewatch Maybe maybe I'll enjoy it more now. Before we leave Adam's family, I've got to ask the boys: Did you have a crush on Christina Ricci growing up? Because I don't. Oh know yeah. Any. I mean, of course. <laughs> oh that's yeah. A, that's a given. You know, honestly, my crush for her actually stemmed more from Casper, oh. um, uh, which actually made my one of my honorable mentions was Casper. But yeah, I, God, she's the her hers Wednesday, especially in the sequel. I was like. I was like, "Be my girlfriend, please." <laughs> so much. Yep. Yeah, like her. Uh, I I feel like that was kind of like the basis of like, man, this is what I want my like dream girlfriend to look like, <laughs> yeah. mixed with like uh, Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman with all the latex on. Mm, I, I remember seeing Batman Returns when I was a kid. I was like, "Yo, uh, <laughs> this has just opened up a different side of me that I didn't know existed." And uh, well, y'all yeah, know what. Ant-Man uh, is into now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, love a little little latex with your... I love it. Your love it, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, yeah, she's one of the most resonant characters from those movies, because, like, there's obviously the Wednesday Adam show is, like, one of the biggest things of the past few years, which I have not... I don't really want to see, but I just think it's special that you know, it's it's live, her character's lived on in some to a certain extent, you know, since since the 60s so um yeah. i think christina ricci is a big reason why that character is like so fondly remembered from those two films for sure she is in the new show as well oh really i didn't even know that well wow. she uh yeah she's a character in that but yeah i won't go on too long about this but yeah <laughs> it was okay it wasn't great it was okay i know everyone every like little teeny bops obsessed with it but exactly it was okay the casting's good. I mean, like, I, is it Luis Guzman? Um, I know he's part of it. Like, it's a cool. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I get like Tim Burton. Uh, I'd, I'd rather see him do other things at this point, but yeah, it's cool. Uh, anyhow, who was who was next? I forget. That was Rigby. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the TV show train and say, "Courage the Cowardly Dog." Oh wow. That was such an amazing fucking show. I still watch it. I still fall asleep to it like multiple times a week. And it was just one of those shows like as a kid that was so different to like everything else on it was like I think was it it was Cartoon Network, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um and I remember it would only kind of come on like a little later in the day and at night. Mm. And um it was so like yeah, different and had so much like obviously horror undertones and some of those episodes were genuinely like terrifying and like unhinged and just like fueled by I'm not sure what drug they were doing but it was so (laughs) unique especially like to make a show like that and make it so like child friendly and like never like super teeter onto being 
you know, not child friendly is just amazing. And uh, I know I talk about it a lot, but I have a really big affinity for like films or shows or anything set in like one place. And I know the majority of those episodes just are set on their little like farmland. Um, yeah, what a great show. I, I loved that was probably between that and Cat Dog. Those yes. were my favorite shows as a kid, but definitely Courage the Cowardly Dog. Like it was amazing. And Courage is like incredibly well made too. Like, yeah. Very rarely mm-hmm. in a cartoon do you see people like actually paying attention to like the use of the camera, but a lot of that shit is like very Hitchcockian almost. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I love the animation style so much. Like I still remember like how the farmer and his li- his wife had this very distinct look that almost creeps me out in a certain way as a kid, like the animation style, but like so so nostalgic um um and like that opened up that just opened my mind up to so many of those you know nickelodeon cartoon network shows that were just so instrumental you said cat dog and uh, Mm. even like like thinking back to like hey arnold in a way like there's this offbeat tone Mm -hmm. in that show that i wouldn't call it spooky but it's like just offbeat um which i think i can definitely fit into the mold of of what we're talking about but you know courage hey arnold was so deep it was so like dramatic and like yeah i just feel like i again i don't know if it's older but i don't see anything nowadays like these shows back then i don't know if it's because like rules have kind of changed but it's just there's nothing there's just dog shit now like (laughs) i feel like it's because like we've gotten to a point where we want to protect children so much that maybe we're deetering like a little bit too far you know yeah absolutely yeah Yeah. and more live action stuff as well now yeah oh god i was gonna say like the i feel like the writing for kids shows has also become more neutered now because Mm -hmm. Back then, I mean, even something as mainstream as like SpongeBob or whatever, like there, there's very like sub subtle subtext of like very adult humor uh, and stuff that more even more so resonates with adults in some ways. Um, and that is not uh, that's not I don't watch any like contemporary kid shows, but I feel like that's not the norm anymore. I don't think any of the adult humor really sneaks in past you know the whatever fucking producers are making these shows. Look at like Ren and Stimpy. Like, oh my God. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the things that got passed by in that show, like when I was like, I was obsessed with it when I was a kid. Going back now, you're like, how? How yeah. is like none of this flagged? I think yeah. Rocco's Modern Life. I was just about to well. say it. Yeah, I was just yeah. about to say that. And that's why stuff like that, I feel, still holds up and why I think people like to go revisit it and show their children. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't hear people talking about wanting to show their fucking kids old episodes of Dora the Explorer or, you know, those super sanitized things. And I'm curious Mm -hmm. to know if children growing up today are going to want to show their kids the stuff they're watching in the way that I feel like, you know, parents our age do yes like i would definitely show my kids rugrats or like doug or recess over the modern whatever garbage oh, yeah. they're yeah. trying to f- um and man I, I i guess another question about your kid like what would you show him any of these weird 90s acid trip of cartoons yeah yes um so all real monsters is definitely one that like i feel he's he's gonna he's gonna grow up loving and knowing um the original beetlejuice cartoon like is definitely another one that he's got to oh, watch wow. yeah um uh, yeah i i would like rugrats doug um rocket power a lot of the stuff i used to watch when i was a kid like rocket power i don't so good yeah i don't hey. think that like i mean a lot of the a lot of the adult content that was in those shows like just went over my head when i was a kid so i'd probably do the same for him i grew up just fine well depending on who you ask you know, <laughs> i feel like I, I grew up relatively well adjusted with those with those cartoons there's a couple here and there like ren and stimpy like is it's it's a little questionable but like again i watched it when i was a kid i'm fine maybe i don't know but definitely would i want to start them off on like the horror ones that i used to watch 
we love that that's that's really like the whole thesis of this podcast you know i get i feel like what's acceptable but what's going to resonate with them but not fuck them up at the same time yeah um, and i feel like maybe even gremlins might have been you know a, a little over the line in some respects but i still it scared the shit out of me as a kid but i still think you know is appropriate i think everything <laughs> we've mentioned is hasn't crossed the line yet but i'm still waiting for something to sneak past the goalposts i guess yeah i think Fuck gremlins is safe character yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Gremlins is safe because you're like the whole time you're watching, you're like, dude, Gizmo's got this. He's gonna whoop ass. Like he, there's no way he's exactly. gonna let all these creepy yeah. ass like Gremlins. Like I think that's fair. It's good. Exactly. Guys. Charlotte, you can just jump into your next one if you want. Okie dokie. My next one is my childhood favorite cartoon, I think, other than Red Rats. Um, it's probably like Tide for Tide. Um, it is like such a fucked up concept for a kid's show. Like two like fucking children win a game with the Grim Reaper, like, and he has to be their best friend forever. Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy iconic mm -hmm. like so many fucked up visuals in that show it's like teeters the line of being like gross and crude but like in the perfect way like not quite as far as like Ren and Stimpy goes I think but like you know just like that perfect amount where it's like still child friendly I fucking idolized Mandy growing you up, are like, so her it's so what funny. a boss so ass her. bitch <laughs> <laughs> like very much my sense of humor like just like that sort of like cruel mean like, <laughs> but intelligent i think um <laughs> like coming from like this little fucking short ass girl in a pink flower dress like i live um <laughs> and it's just like a fucking fun show like i don't think there is a single episode that i dislike um Grim is like perfect comedic relief. Um, and you like feel so sorry for him, like yeah. the shit these people put them through. Um, all of the netherworld like characters are fantastic. I love like the creature design. It's, mm -hmm. I can't believe Ant Man hasn't seen it because it just feels like so you. I know it does. One of these days, we're gonna, like, sit and we're gonna, like, stream it on HBO Max together because you're gonna fucking love it. <laughs> I'm, I'm down. Okay. It's, like, very, like, in my brain, there's this genre called, like, Texas goth, and I feel like <laughs> it's uh, very Texas goth in my brain. <laughs> I remember watching that as a kid and loving it, but even as a kid, watching Billy and being, like, he is just brain rot. Like he is so like it, this is so stupid, and he kind of annoyed me. Mm -hmm. But I, I just remember being like literal brain rot, just <laughs> the dumbest fucking character on For TV. Of you who have seen it, did you have a favorite like side character type thing? I'm trying to think. God, it's been a while since I've seen it. I think there was there an episode. Oh, I like can picture like what what the thing was, but I can't remember what the episode was about. It was like a creature, obviously. I can't remember. I haven't seen it in a long time. I personally love Jeff the Spider. Billy yes, Spider. that that's what I'm thinking of. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. I was like, I knew it was like in the in their house, and it was like mm. like. like stayed there but now i remember it was like billy's son or whatever <laughs> which is so like unhinged that he yeah. hated and just like would abuse the fuck out of oh, yeah it. and then nurgle <laughs> is great grandpa dracula fantastic what about you, you i i haven't seen it and i i only saw a handful of episodes i haven't seen it in like close to like 15 mm. years so i cannot tell you i would love to revisit it though it's Gosh. Um, speaking of spiders, that would would Ant Man be able to stomach the uh, cartoon spider and the, or the arachnophobia? 
animated enough i think and he's like such a nice guy like that's the thing is jeff is like the nicest person in the tv show person um (laughs) (laughs) that you just like feel so bad for him because he's just constantly being swatted at (laughs) by this person that he thinks is his father and he just Uh wants his approval which i feel like speaks to so many of us (laughs) absolutely (laughs) Damn, I, I I really want to revisit that for sure. Um, I feel anyhow. like you were either a K and D kid or you were a Billy and Mandy kid. They were made by the same people, and oh really? Definitely a Billy and Mandy kid. What other show? Um, Kids Net Store. Oh, I fucking loved. Kids I was Kids I was Store. more yeah I was more that. Mm-hmm. I watched like every episode. I'm just saying Mandy took over Kids Net Store. Kids Net Store did not take over the Grandma and <laughs> Billy and Mandy. Yeah, they did have a crossover, right? Mm-hmm. Oh. No way. I didn't even know. Yeah. Wow. Like the wild Epic. thornberries and the rug rats. Oh, iconic. That was, <laughs> that great. was iconic. That was great. That was great. Um, rug rats go to Paris is, an, is one that... I, I watched that was another like blockbuster rental that I just wore the shit out of the VHS. Um, I don't even know if it was necessarily good, but like all the Rugrats movies, mm-hmm. I would watch so many times. So I, was, obsessed. I was obsessed with them. Yeah, they were great. The fucking um, first one was like sort of terrifying, like the scene of the monkey gets its nanners where like Tommy is about to like bash. That's right. Yeah. The fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. Um. All right. I'll go next. Uh, this is a bit of an offbeat choice because it's not technically a horror movie, but it is. I will say it's like single-handedly the movie that fucked me up as a kid the most. Um, and it, it might sound fucking crazy, but uh, George Miller's sequel to Babe, Babe, Big Pig in the City, <laughs> was a movie that <laughs> fucked me up. Have you like? First of all, have you guys seen it? I've only seen Babe. I've seen Babe. I have not seen Babe. Do yourselves a favor and watch it immediately because it is a fucking whacked out kids movie that features some of the scariest imagery, at least in my head, because like I saw this when I was like maybe three or four years old because Babe, the first movie was like me and my brother's like favorite movie. We watch it over and over. And then when the sequel came out at VHS, we rented that. And we watched it over and over and over again, but mainly because we were so just affected by it to like to our core. Cause like there's Babe goes to the city, obviously, and he is just confronted by like the seediest, you know, weirdest batch of characters at this hotel that he sort of resides in. And there's like this creepy clown. There's like a batch of like uh circus animals that he sort of has to compete against, like all these chimpanzees. It's just it's just so creepy. I can't. It's so hard to describe this movie because like you just have to see it to to fully get to grasp. And just the fact that it's a sequel to Babe, which is one of the most wholesome uh, films of all time. Um, George Miller took it into like a very perverse, but also just incredibly rich territory. That I think it's one of like the most underrated sequels ever made. Um, and as an adult, like that's a movie that I'll throw on just to to blow someone's mind. I'm like, hey, do you ever see the Babe sequel that? barely anyone talks about and they're like and it always almost is always like a winner everyone always comes out of it like that was fucking weird and crazy and dark um and i'm a big sucker also for movies that just kind of show the weird juxtaposition of like city life versus rural life and how somewhat like this sort of fish out of water sort of take on it and how it could kind of royally fuck up that that person uh going to t- this sort of new territory um and i think george miller like i said with um uh joe dante i think is just a genius um at crafting such a weird off-putting tone um and yeah fucked me up as a kid and i just i highly recommend <laughs> y'all check it out if if you haven't seen it yet but yeah i, I just love it i remember imagine logging that <laughs> It's got to get logged now. <laughs> I would be so happy. Discord's oh. going to be like freaking out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see. Have you seen it, Ant-Man? I ha- I saw in theaters like when it first came out. I 
I haven't seen it since. I haven't thought about it since. Not in a bad way. <laughs> uh, fuck. Now I, I want to revisit it. Cause I want, uh, again, if it's if it's that like bat shit crazy, it's, I could be another one chalked up to why the hell was I watching this when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, it, it's so devious because it's it's billed as a very light kids movie, but then you watch it and it's like. It is what it is. I again, it's hard to explain, but <laughs> it is what it is. I, it is. It you is what it is. There. You had to be there. Um, and like the the lady farmer who's who's I don't I don't think James Cromwell who's in the first movie is in this, and it's like the lady farmer gets like detained by the TSA, and and basically Babe is like oh, banished from the airport, and like is just in the sea all by itself. <laughs> so like that concept alone fucked me up as a kid. Like this <laughs> this abandoned pig just like in the middle of. <laughs> Um, whatever oh. ominous city it is, um, but yeah, I I I love it so much, and I hope you all <laughs> first you know feel the need to one day just like fuck it, you know, babe too. <laughs> I'll probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, you're next, Ant Man. All right, so uh, this was a a toss up for me because. I was going to put the little shop of horrors in there. And, uh, you know, that also speaks to me on like a, a fetish or like a kink as I grew up with like <laughs> B- BDSM and stuff like that with the, uh, with the, uh, the sh- fucked up dentist. Um, I pivoted though. And I went with the 1990 uh, masterpiece starring Angelica Houston. So bringing that back around yes. the witches. Yeah. Oh yes. Um that's another one that I used to watch a lot when I was a kid and the scene when they're in that like conference room and they're like is everything good and they start peeling off their hair and all the other shit and their hook noses start to come out terrified the fuck out of me when I was mm-hmm. a kid. If I saw mm-hmm. that I would be goners. And then like you know a, a kid getting turned into a, a mouse and like th- what happens like what happens if you don't get to come back like you're stuck as this mouse now everything's for you sucks like your lifespan is shorter uh like you have to worry about getting killed by all these other things like your family and friends your grandma all that stuff like it it sucks like but another iconic role for angelica houston like i watched the remake i wasn't really that big of a fan of it just because the practical effects and, and, and just how it was filmed. And not to mention like the director, you know, uh, was it Nicholas rogue went on. He did, he yeah. did before that did like, don't look now. And the man who fell to earth and all that stuff. Like incredible. It, yeah. yeah it's got so, some classic shit under his belt. So, um, the witches, I, I definitely, I appreciated the fact that the remake came because a lot of kids and a lot of like p- people that maybe didn't know the original existed started to go back and watch that. And as I got older, that's, I stopped shitting on remakes because it does give the originals like a little Mm -hmm. bit of a spotlight, but fuck like just, if you could have just gotten there without the remake, that would have been better. That's better. At the very least you get an influx of like Blu-ray thingies coming out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Does that a lot though. He he remakes Pinocchio and he shits on our childhood uh, quite a few times in, in his later career so yeah, um, it's okay though yeah, yeah. Guillermo del you... Toro went and rectified that absolutely that absolutely I remember That's watching what? that as a kid or the witches as a kid and also being terrified but I remember re-watching it I want to say like two or three years ago and I was watching like the scene when they're they're in a hotel right Mm-hmm. That's where they are, yeah. yeah. And they're in that big room having their little conference or whatever. And I was like, hold on a minute. And I paused it and realized that a ton of the like witches, they just put like old men in wigs like, in the background. <laughs> I don't know if y'all have ever noticed that. It is the funniest no. fucking thing. I'm like, oh my God, that's literally just an old man in a wig. And it's so funny. Like next time you watch it, <clears throat> just look I... out for it. I need to because like my eyes were always focused on Angelica Houston just because the way she talked in that movie too mm. it's very like very I, I don't want to say sexual but like, just very very she's sexy like a, sounding it's titillating she's like yeah. alluring she's really alluring in that movie like though. damn man like I could see how yeah. like if I was there <laughs> and I didn't see you turn into this like witch thing 
I, I would have been lured in for sure. I'd be I would have accepted a chocolate bar from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so that's that's my pick. It's a I'm great so movie. Glad you brought it up because it was like ripping my eye teeth out to like <laughs> cut it from my list. Mm. Hell yeah. Man, I'm curious to see what uh what beat it out. Well, I just decided I wanted to like highlight more like obscure shit and stuff for the most part. And then like I had my like things that I just feel like embody the genre that I had to like also put in. Definitely fair. Yeah, I'm absolutely. glad that, that you enjoy the witches. It's one of my favorites. I love anything like Roald Dahl though. Mm. He's just mm -hmm. like one of those like, you know, people who like sneaks like creepy cruel stuff into like children's media and we love him for it oh yeah, yeah. totally great. i feel like I, w I didn't see the witches actually till i was a bit older but i went on this run where i was i, I think it was like witches of east eastwick which i loved death becomes her um and that and, like there's this i don't even know what to classify these movies as but it's like these it's i just kind of see it's like these female actresses that just kind of get free reign to just play these outlandishly just beautiful characters in these genre movies and like i there's like a whole batch of films like that like including the witches that are just so fucking fun to watch when it like october comes around and death becomes her i, I thought of a little bit but i don't know how that's not really geared towards kids as much but it has this zany kind of heightened tone that i really really respond to yeah i remember watching that as a kid and there was something about seeing a woman with a big ass hole missing from her walking around with her head twisted around <laughs> yeah or like at the end where they fall down the stairs and they're all fucking mm -hmm. discombobulated it used to scare me mm -hmm. when i was a kid but i was yeah. morbidly curious i'm like it's scary but i want to keep watching <laughs> it's so good the effects still look pretty damn great in this day and age too which is good oh, yeah. um hell yeah love the witches uh rigby what do you got for your next one so mine's kind of like a two in one because I'm going to say all of these films, but specifically one in particular. So I'm going to say the universal horror monster films. I know. Yes. But specifically Frankenstein. Um, yeah. I remember watching that probably when I was more creeping up to 12, I would say. And I think, like, I mean, <sighs> say what you want, but, I mean, I, I think all of you here will agree with me, but I remember watching that film, and I think it was the first time I truly was, like, appreciating, like, cinema uh, as, like, an art form. Um, and it, it just, like, it blew me away, and, like, Boris Karloff in that role is just so stunning, it looks stunning. I mean, I know it like holds up to today. I mean, all of them, Rich from the Black Lagoon, Bride of Frankenstein, Wolfman. I love them all, especially the mm -hmm. Mummy too, which I think the Mummy's is great. one that needs great. a little more love. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I have a tattoo of Frankenstein's monster and the little girl down at like the pond when the he pushes water, her yeah. in, which I know is yeah. morbid, but to me, even at that age, I thought was just such a beautiful scene and like it really captured the essence of like a misunderstood monster and i think probably all of us here kind of felt like that as a kid just a little like misplaced um mm -hmm. and yeah even like it's horror yes but you know that is also i know i keep talking about gateways but like i said at the beginning of the podcast all of these films are what kind of like opened my eyes to my love of film so that one especially is one that really just struck me super hard as a kid and made me really appreciate, you know, cinema, especially one that's, you know, so old as well. Those movies are so easy to throw on to because they're like 70 minutes, very tight, very visually rich. You know, like I, I even think back to Bride of Frankenstein with like the windmill scene and how fucking gorgeous that is i'm a big mm. fan of the invisible man too that's one of my favorites yes yeah. yeah it's fucking incredible um but i'm so that's so cool that you have a tattoo of the pond sequence because that's like it's it's fucked up but it's so poetic at the same yeah. time and so you know 
oddly, like you said, kind of relatable to, to Boris Karloff in that moment. Um, yeah, so good. Yeah. What life would have been like if, if Bella Lugosi would have actually accepted playing that role instead of saying it's not sexy enough? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Man. It's... I'm I'm glad you brought up the mummy though, because that is that movie is definitely very, very like it's never brought up ever. It's mm-hmm. yeah. I love Frankenstein. It's always Frankenstein, uh uh Dracula, even the creature. And to me, uh... the creatures is my favorite of the monsters the look mm. but the mummy always gets left out even the invisible yeah. man always gets left it out. does like yeah, yeah. claude rains is the invisible man is outstanding mm. and the uh, the effects for that time mm-hmm. holy shit dude it, it doesn't get better yeah it's insane yeah all, i mean all... go ahead no, i was just gonna say like another one i really like is the wolf man yeah uh, which yeah. is another like the, the costuming in that film especially is just so fucking good. But go ahead, Ricky. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say that, I mean, without those films, like horror wouldn't, wouldn't be what it is today. Like there was just that sweet spot in history and time of those films and nothing ever in my eyes captures that essence now. And it's just such a treasured time Agreed. in horror absolutely it is horror like maybe at its purest form in that in that sort of time period because it's just so everything's so simplistic and it's all about just the visuals and the music and performance like there's no other gloss or anything really put on top Mm. of it it's just so pure um and so practical as well like it's just insane like i always i love 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 practical over cgi any day and it's just you know Mm. that's why even like people who i mean i know there's i know people who kind of shit on guillermo del toro's new pinocchio film and i'm like it is so hard for me to like dislike any sort of like stop motion animation or anything that's like so practical it's like the amount of effort and time and work and skill that needs to go in that like right big time I will also say, like the original Universal Monsters, like uh, not just not only did it bring that horror element to it, but a very strong dramatic element. Like in Bride yeah. of Frankenstein, like whenever the bride sees the Frankenstein's monster, and he's like hopeful, like oh this is my mate, and she freaks out and he cries. Like fuck, I remember being a mm-hmm. kid. I didn't understand why, but I got teary eyed. Like poor yeah. guy, dude, he just wants to be loved. Yeah. There's a reason. Go ahead, Charlotte. Oh, I was just going to yeah. say, is it safe to say that I'm alone in preferring Hammer Horror over Universal? No, I fucking love Hammer Horror, too. I was just about to ask you guys if you guys, you know, if you're not, like Terrence Fisher and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's so good. Yeah, Christopher Lee as, as Dracula. Like, I think that was that's probably my favorite Dracula. Same. Yeah. That is. The atmosphere, yeah. too, of like the yeah. British countryside is just mm-hmm. so iconic. Yeah, the curse of Frankenstein too. Like, I love Peter Cushion's Frankenstein, and that is so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a different type of atmosphere, but it's it's very like, yeah. There's something about it that's so infectious. Um, it's just more gothic and dreamy. Mm-hmm. I feel. Totally, oh, totally. Uh, love that we got to fit that in. I never would have thought of that as because I didn't. I personally didn't watch those until I was like more of a teenager. Um, but I, I wish I'd watched them as a kid because I feel like I would have eaten that shit up, like the Frankenstein and the Invisible Man specifically. Mm-hmm. If you haven't got the get the four Ks, the four K transfers <laughs> are fucking amazing for. Those I want people. them. I want them so bad. They look Amazon, gorgeous. Dude, yeah. a- Amazon, they'll they'll have random sales. Mm-hmm. Absolutely worth it. I hope they continue it. Yeah. They put them all out, but at least the first four that I have, um, mm-hmm. dude, the transfers are just. For a movie being that damn old, it's so good. Yeah. I I was always skeptical about 4K horror movies specifically, but last night my friend showed me his copy of Texas Chainsaw in, in 4K, and it still like maintains that grainy, you know, sort of aesthetic and while looking just like very crisp and, and clean at the same time. Um, and so it's yeah, I I it made me want to go out and just buy all of my favorite horror movies on 4K and just rewatch them in that sort of format too. So I, I will get on that for sure. Yeah. 
But anyway, uh, we're I think guess we're at our final picks now. So uh, back to where we started, Charlotte. What's your f- last thing you're going to talk about? So I think my final pick is like what I consider the epitome of like children's horror. Um, they're sort of standing behind me. I don't know if you can see my VHS copies, <laughs> but the Goosebumps TV series from like the 90s is just like so good like Mm -hmm. 30 minute to an hour you know like slices of like horror aimed at kids that still manages to be like terrifying as hell half of the time i think gets a little goofier down the line i think but like we all have like at least one episode i think that like really stands out to us um whether it's, you know, Curse of Werewolf Swamp or uh, or the Curse of Fever Swamp. and um, Wow, that brings me back. Oh the, my god. Fucking, <laughs> um, the Haunted say, Mask or Welcome to Dead Dark. House. I was just about yeah. to say, that was my personal favorite. Welcome to Dead House still fucking, like, creeps me the fuck out. Like, the atmosphere of it and the idea of, like, a town being filled with like zombie people who like keep inviting new people in so they can drain them of their essence is like fucking like ooh. it was like i remember like genuinely like having to like leave the room and like be with an adult when i was like a little kid because of that <laughs> movie do you all have a favorite episode or yes i have a lot say cheese and die was the first one i thought of immediately but then i just thought about um horrorland was another one like any any horror uh or any theme park based horror was it it is another thing that just really drew me in and like the monsters that all the monsters in that episode um were just so fucking fun um so like those two are definitely the ones that come to mind yeah, yeah. when i was a kid like uh like I said, I we didn't ha- I didn't have a lot growing up, but my mom like would scrimp and save, and she put me in the Goosebumps uh, like book club. So oh, every month I would I get like that. two or three books. Um, and the cover for Say Cheese and Die like still is ingrained into my brain to this day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the, best. the the one that would uh, scare me a lot though when I was a kid was I think it's called the Night of the Living Dummy with Slappy yeah Mm -hmm. i fucking hated him i hated i hated dolls and uh, because at that same time too my my sister had a well she's my cousin i'm the only child but my mom basically raised my cousin who i consider my sister but she used to have a teddy ruxpin when when we were younger Mm -hmm. and that thing would fucking go off by itself all the time and Mm -hmm. it would scare the shit out of me and immediately i would think of not a living dummy um but yeah i agree there's nothing that sums up better than then the goosebumps is like mm. gateway to children's horror. It's so good. Mm-hmm. R.L. Stein really just like bottled magic with that series. Yeah. And, you know, oh, yeah. I feel like for a lot of us, it was like our gateway into reading and loving like horror mm. novels in addition to film, too. Agreed. I remember my mom would like read me a chapter a night, like when I was a kid. And oh, yeah. I read One Day at Horror Land. And I remember fucking just being obsessed with that book. Mm. I loved it so much. And I love things that have, it's weird. I don't know how to describe it, but like almost like challenges or like different things. And I know in that book, like they go down like the slot, like the slide scene. Holy shit. That scared the yeah. shit out of me as a kid when I read that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the haunted mask episode when she's like, this is my night. Halloween is my night. I'm like, that's me. Like, please. <laughs> like, I remember, like, just resonating so much with, mm. like, that scene. Um, <laughs> God, yeah, the Goosebumps books. I I t- try to still co- still collect them if I see them at, like, a thrift store or anything. And I have a bunch still. But, God, yeah, like, the covers alone. The like, covers you, don't have to, you don't even have to read them. Just the covers are just stunning. And the little ones that are, like, raised Goosebumps as well. Mm. They're so good. Absolutely. Oh. And then they changed the game when they started coming out with like the choose your own adventure mm-hmm. books. You're like, damn, you mean to tell me this isn't predetermined already? Like I have kind of control over this. This is cool. Yeah, yeah that right, was right. cool. I had like a crazy fear of basements as a kid. 
So I remember the one ep- uh, book about where their dad's like doing this weird shit in the basement and these um that was like really resonated with me um um yeah and i remember the ep- the the actual episodes that was based on like that was like really visually striking as a kid i was like holy shit that's like such a that captures the essence of a scary basement basement so perfectly um and i feel like that's rl stein's like is his hat trick is like finding the shit that we're scared of as kids but not like overtly scared of you know like clowns but like very everyday things mm. um and I, that's why he's such a genius and like like you were saying about he's like a gateway like i would never gotten into like stephen king and, and all, some of my favorite horror off- authors if it wasn't for him it's like he like the idea of just sitting down and reading a scary story just kind of at least for me really really stems from from reading those books yeah Definitely. One yeah. side does a training brawl for Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them. That's perfect. Stein and King like really write children so well, which is strange considering they're older men. But just something they get it. Like it's like when I think back to like when I was a kid, I'm like I don't think I could really write how a kid fell. It, it's just. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're great at writing children. Weird to say, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. And and you're right, Charlotte. Like that's that's the probably the the quintessential pick of the day cuz like we all all of us are like ingrained in that shit. Um and anyone who's a fan of horror, that's where if you're cool, that's where you started. It's like, um would we be where we are loving for like we do without goosebumps? I don't know. But. Exactly. Which exactly. is like, it's strange to think like nowadays, like what, what do kids watch to like yeah. get into horror? You know, I don't think there's really anything new or out uh, there. Maybe like Wednesday, but that's still an adaptation. I was about to say, yeah, it's except yeah. Like, nothing original. Yeah. yeah. Stranger they're, things, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. They're rebooting goosebumps. Oh wow! It, it doesn't. I'm really. scared because Disney is doing it. Yeah. I love Disney, but I don't want like a sanitized version of. Yeah, this. I saw the yeah. trailer and I'm like, mm. yeah. Do you guys I ever see the? I will say. I mean, you're Jack, about to say it. The Jack Black one. That's a good I movie. I liked it. It yeah, is it a is. good movie. I like Jack I Black. So. It. It's. I it's, did like the it capture you could tell i don't know who made it but whoever did like you could tell that they're, they're like us they're just very much a huge fan of the, the books and everything so it's a very faithful adaptation um but i i bet you know that i hope the disney stuff doesn't really neuter the the fun of how dark some of them got you know so high hopes but whatever which can you say with disney I feel like the original series, at least, just sort of introduced this idea that it can be fun to be scared. And I feel mm-hmm. like that's sort of lost in a lot of media for kids these days. Because, like, I love that feeling of, like, you know, a fright. But also it teaches, you know, you that, you know, there are bad things in the world, but they can be overcome. And I think that's what's so important about mm-hmm. children's horror. Totally. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf uh, in my peripheries and I'm like, why the hell don't I have any Goosebumps books? I have to like, call my parents and have them mail them out to me so I can reread all of them. Um, okay, I'll go next. Um, so I, I got to say, originally I had Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho as my number one pick, but I don't think we need anyone else singing the praises of Hitchcock on a podcast anymore. So I kind of glossed over that, but I just want to say, I watched that so much as a kid um, and really just got me into horror in general, but I want to talk about fun horror. I think like, I'm glad that Charlotte set that up. I want to talk about the most fun I've ever had with like a kid's horror film. And this might date me a little bit of my age, but this came out in 2000, 2005 and it, it's just a wonderful um very much inspired by Goosebumps, I think, uh, is Monster House, uh, which is an animated yes. film that I fucking love. Um, it's it captures the whole, you know, kids discovering a mysterious sort of entity um, in their neighborhood feeling that we all, you know, again, Goosebumps that we all just fucking love. Um, and 
this movie is just is just super funny on top of that like the kids have it's it's very witty and well written and the kids are kind of doofuses they're not they're not very uh equipped to handle the situation which makes the whole movie just hilarious and the the girl that they team up with she's like this try hard like girl scout whatever um and obviously they're they're crushed mad crush on her and everything and it's just super fun the voice cast is so incredible too you know jason lee and maggie gyllenhaal um steve buscemi obviously um but at the core of it all like it's just a very profoundly dark you know story of how this monster house came to be like i, I always remember that backstory scene of c buscemi or, or mr nevercracker i should say de- describing what happened to his wife um and this whole like circus freak sort of origin story that led to this whole haunting you know happening and it's like god damn it's deep i remember seeing that in the theater i'm like whoa they re- you know this really elevated to, to much more of a thing and obviously like the, the effects of the monster house and everything is so just so nostalgic for me um it can it obviously it ties into trick-or-treating because like the whole like end goal of the movie is to make sure like kids don't get eaten by the house when they're trick-or-treating and everything so it fits into that halloween uh mold pretty cleanly um and yeah everything about it it just, it just fits all my sensibilities of humor and then scares and this coming of age uh uh tie-in as well um and puberty, man. I love puberty. I love the, I love horror and puberty like intertwined. <laughs> like Ginger Snaps is another example that I fucking love. Um, but I digress. Um, I mean, I, again, that dates me a little bit. I was like eight or nine when that came out, but you know, I watch it every fucking Halloween. I love it so much. I don't think anything has ever like written twelve to thirteen year old boys. So <laughs> the Mountain Dew piss bottles is just too fucking real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're like arguing whose pee is is whose. That's, mm-hmm. That would fucking gets me. That yeah. is such a great pick. I also love that film, and I remember kind of being scared by it as well. Like the oh, yeah. mm-hmm. the, the, house the wife, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, God, that is such another one that's like set in one place as well. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. I feel like everyone Absolutely. has that house in their neighborhood too. Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. It, yeah, exactly. Right down the street from mine, there's two abandoned houses. They've been abandoned as long as I I could even imagine. And there's like a hole falling through the roof of one of them. And like apparently the rumors are that they run like prostitution out of them and stuff. But like you go buy them. And like the front door, it just looks like I don't want to go anywhere near this house. Yes. And that's like another primal thing, like as a kid that you're just so easily terrified by. And like I was a big ding dong ditch kid. You know, I was that, that was, I very much entertained myself by fucking with adults and stuff. And like that, but this movie kind of jump starts with like ding dong ditching his house. And like that's how the inciting incident is like every step of this movie is like super relatable to me um and also like talk about jokes or lines in movies that would never fly today for in a kid's film where she the girls she calls them mentally challenged at one point yeah and like, yeah and she's like if so i'm certified to teach you baseball or something <laughs> it's like the fucking funniest yeah. line that's like this was written like for kids and it's so mm-hmm. great um yeah even talking about it now i just kind of want to throw it on I just, yeah. you know, I, I can't wait to watch it. That's how, like, 13-year-olds talk, unfortunately. A hundred percent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, uh, so good. Um, so that wraps up mine. Uh, Ant-Man, what's your, what's your final pick? I'm very surprised that this has not been chosen yet. Um, I might be beating Rigby to it. Maybe not. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I am going to be bringing it back to uh, Mr. Tim Burton. Uh, I feel that this film is something that since it came, well, since I was a kid, because it came out, I think, when did it come out? Let me see. Uh, Yeah, it came out a year before I was born. And ever since I could ever remember, I've watched it every single year without fail. And Mm -hmm. the last like five years I've seen in the theater every single year. Um, I even have a tattoo of the sandworm on my arm, and I know exactly oh, you wow. know, where this is going. Wow, the wow. Details. Wait. 
You guys both have yes. matching. <laughs> um, Tim Burton's Beetlejuice. Mm. Um, I feel that like the, aesthetically, the look of that film, I, I especially the Deets house uh, uh, when it, it gets into those like weird ass sculptures and stuff. Uh, it just screams. That's that that aesthetic is just so fucking good, and that that sums me up to like a T when it, at least trying to keep it into like a realm of kids stuff. Um, that movie also got away with a lot that I don't, well, you, you could not do in a PG movie to this day. Literally the scene where uh, Beetlejuice is down there and he's like, honk, honk, nice fucking model. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I never <laughs> realized that was in the movie. And one of my old jobs, I used to work at this like, um, like a used movie store where people would just come and sell their stuff and, and whatnot. And I would put it on and we had the, we had like a, like a PA system or like a, like a, um, a loudspeaker over so everything was just like attached to that and so everybody in the store could hear what you're watching and I remember I'm like looking through DVDs trying to find you know if what I'm going to buy from this person and I hear that and I look up when the fuck when when did, when did he ever say that because I always watched it on like ABC Family and stuff like that obviously that's going to mm. get bleeped out Um, but that or like you know <laughs> his like this this the nightclub that he he likes to visit uh yeah very adult i actually have that sign mm-hmm. in my hallway um cool. uh, <laughs> and michael keaton as beetlejuice like man, man talk about like a movie that like he transcends his character so much if you're real if you really look at it beetlejuice is only in that film for like maybe 10 minutes top yeah yeah i think it's 16 he's yeah, yeah. like it's <laughs> such a small amount compared to everything else but like you cannot think about beetlejuice without thinking about michael keaton and the fact that like they're they're finally making the sequel like i don't give a shit i don't even care if it's bad like just let me see mm-hmm. all my favorite characters back together again being mm-hmm. how they're going to be you know, I, I love this resurgence of Michael Keaton again, which is very, very cool. You know, seeing him as Batman again, like, fuck, I never thought that would ever happen. You know, granted, the movie that surrounding it may, may not be the, like the best movie, but yeah. like just to see like him being able to revisit the old iconic roles that he he built many people's childhood base off of. And I, I know for a fact that I could not be the person I am today and, and be into the same stuff as I am today without him as his portrayal of Beetlejuice. Absolutely. One of his, one of the quintessential performances ever, and especially in a Tim Burton movie. Like, I feel like he, he helped Tim Burton find his voice as like, uh, crafting these very, very outlandishly just rich characters, you know, and a lot of that's owed to Michael Keaton's just manic mania of a performance. You know? Oh yeah. And like yeah. you, when well, you look at Batman, whenever Tim Burton first was like going to cast him as Bruce Wayne for Batman, people were pissed. They're like, there's no way this guy's like a comedian or whatever. Like yeah. this isn't, this isn't Batman. This isn't Bruce Wayne, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> people were livid. And then the movie came out and they're like, Oh my God. Yeah. He's like, let's get nuts. And we're like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, then you just double down with that in Batman Returns. And like, not only mm. do you deliver like the iconic uh, character of Batman, but then you have like now somebody who I solidify as Catwoman, no matter what, Michelle Pfeiffer. The and, greatest. Yeah. And Danny DeVito as the penguin. Like, is mm. he, is that exactly how the character is? No, but fuck, I can't yeah. not think of Danny DeVito as the penguin, you know? So, mm. uh, yeah, Michael Keaton, man. Like, I, I don't know if that, if Beetlejuice and whatnot helped his career, but it de- definitely didn't hurt it. And uh, he really yeah. set the tone for how um, Batman would like go on to be portrayed for like the rest of yeah. the time. Yep. I feel. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. That was my second blockbuster. I knew it. Yeah. I knew it. Uh, yeah. That and the Adams family always on repeat. And yeah, I mean everything you said, I agree with. Like. It teeters on my favorite Burton film. Like I have the tattoo as well. Uh, it's just fucking fantastic. Like the rewatch factor as well is just so incredible. And yeah, the nice fucking model thing. I remember seeing that as a kid or hearing it and being like, like, oh my <laughs> gosh, like you swore, but oh God, yeah. what an incredible fucking film. And yeah, just <laughs> such a pivotal, spooky, emo, goth kid, mm-hmm. central cinema. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, many would say Hocus Pocus. I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna go with Beetlejuice. Like, mm-hmm. nothing to uh, me says like spooky season than Beetlejuice. Yeah, 
I had Hocus so Pocus. Rich. It's, and the, it's, the Danny it's, Elfman score as well. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I, lo- I love Elfman so much. I, I speaking of Burton, like I was, I was tossing around the idea of of Scissor Hands and and Batman Returns a lot while, while making this list. Even Pee Wee, because um, oh. there's like there's shades of you know a <laughs> lot of of gothic stuff throughout those movies. There's a spe- I mean, obviously Scissor large, Hands. Large. Large, yeah. Dumb large. That used to fucking, scare me when I was a uh, kid. Fucked me up, dude, so much. Um, I was Batman Returns. I, I always love to talk about, but that again, Christmas movie. That's that's yeah. a very that's a big Christmas movie. So, um, but yeah, I'm glad we 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 had to show Burton some shine. Like at the top, we said like he's the grandfather of, of scaring the shit out of kids. So, oh, um, yeah, definitely. Maybe yeah. we should do an episode on spooky kids movies. Or not spooky kids movies, spooky right. Christmas movies. I'm sorry, yes. my brain. <laughs> yes, I was like the rest of my coffee. I was waiting for you to say part two, but like, oh, <laughs> uh, uh, I would love that. Spooky Christmas movies are one of my favorite subgenres. And same, dude. I have uh, a whole section dedicated to yeah. Christmas horror films. Uh yeah, Krampus is is a big one for me. Mm. Uh, which I was gonna another one. I I was kind of gonna say was Have you guys seen Trick or Treat? Uh, the 2006. <laughs> of course yeah, yeah yeah you got it um yeah that was another one that was that was high do you guys have any other honorable mentions that you want to like highlight oh wait i haven't done my my number one yet i thought you had oh i thought it was beetlejuice i'm sorry no okay my bad Ooh. my bad my bad go ahead sorry um okay i'm classifying this as spooky kids and i don't care because fuck it because it's my last one and it was the ultimate obsession of my teenage years. And it is another Tim Burton film. And it is Sweeney Todd. Yes. Uh, um, I cannot emphasize how obsessed with this movie I was. Um, I, I hadn't seen the play or anything. But from the soundtrack to the film, um, like... Weirdly, I think I, I launched myself into this film because it was also right when my parents got divorced um obviously being an only child it was like very hard on me like really really hard and for some reason my soul just latched onto this fucking film and i feel like it is i think it's rated r it has to be but fuck it it's fine it it is like a gateway to horror because it is horror obviously but the blood and obviously like that it's a musical is so like extravagant and the blood's all like super it's like camp. bright red. Yeah. Mm. And Huck, like my taste in film was so like <laughs> formed around that, like so incredible. Um, I mean, it's the perfect just I know it's not Elfman, it's Stephen Sondheim, I believe, mm. but like the Burton bottom carter depp trio like just the perfect the, the perfect film that they could have come out with together um and yeah like i watched that i think when i was 14 like i don't even know how many times it had to be over 50 for sure wow. like it was just on repeat like and the soundtrack was on repeat and i swear like when i'd visit my mom and dad separately like they would just be like shut the fuck up <laughs> like we were in the car i was with my dad and i always play the soundtrack in the car and he's not like a musical guy and i could just feel the like rage but he would never say anything he was just like i hate this <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it just i love that film so much to this day like it's it weirdly holds a special place because i think it got me through my parents divorce strangely enough so you yeah. know what's weird is my parents actually went through a divorce as well when that movie came out. And I remember me and my mom, uh, it was our first Christmas, like just me and her. And it was in the theaters and we went to go mm-hmm. see it. And we saw it twice on Christmas Day. And then we went back a few days later and went to go see it again. And same thing, me and her both became obsessed with that. I remember uh, <clears throat> pirating uh, pirating copy. <laughs> uh, and we would just watch it all the time too. And, and I, I don't know exactly what it is about the film, uh, other than it just looks great, the music is amazing, the direction is great, and uh, Charlotte hit it. Camp, you know, it it was really cool to see Camp on the big screen on that level, um, you know, in two thousand seven or whatever, 
you know, something that you hadn't seen in a, in a long time. You know, their movies had to be gritty and they had to be serious and hostile vibes and all that other stuff. And like to see that, you know, violence still can be kind of fun. Uh, I probably would have eaten one of those meat pies. Like, <laughs> we love cannibalism. Yes. You, yes. I mean, you said earlier, cannibalism, sexy. Like, <laughs> even like. I was so attracted to Johnny Depp in that movie as well. I was like, I need this man. <laughs> so hot. <laughs> oh, yeah. I must confess, I've actually never seen Sweeney Todd. Um, I've seen it on stage, funny enough, but I've mm. never seen Tim Burton's adaptation. Um, the music's incredible, though. I love the music so much. Um, yeah. But I will put that on the top of my spooky season yes. list. It's a big blind spot. Damn. Um, yeah. Definitely like uh, Johnny Depp singing too, and they're like, is it, yeah, his, his voice is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Definitely. they all sing. Even Timothy Spall fucking sings in that. Yeah, love him <laughs> so much. And Alan Rickman too. Yeah. <sighs> R.I.P. So, yeah, you know. rest in peace. What a but, cast! Oh my god. Um, I will say real quick. I think "A Little Priest" is my favorite song in that film. Mm, so Fuck, good. So dude. fun. Yeah. So good. Love it. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't wait to see it. Um, well, that wraps up the official list. Uh, like I said before, I rudely interrupted Rigby. Do you guys have any uh, honorables you want to throw out there? I know we can go on forever, I'm sure, but, you know, feel free. I uh, felt like I was ripping my teeth out, not putting Paranorman on this list. Oh, God. That's literally my number six movie, yeah. Love. The first time me and my best friend ever met in person because I'm a child of the internet era um, <laughs> was to see Paranorman when it came out. Oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. One of mine was Creep Show. Fuck yes. Creep Show's the best. That's one the or best. two. I love one. I do like two, except the first segment. Yeah. Is a little like it, but the first mm. one book me. The soundtrack, John Harrison. God bless him. Uh, is King Romero Harrison like <laughs> it's, just, it's fucking amazing? It's wild that a lot of people generally forget that Romero is the one that did the first creep show. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, agree. The first creep show is like my favorite. Although the raft from the second one, fuck, it's I think yeah. that's probably like my favorite anthology horror. Or anything it's just so mm. it's yeah. everything I wanted in in something. It's so good, mm. scary. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, it is scary. The first one. With like the sequence with Ted Danson still fucks me up on oh, the beach. Yeah. Yeah. Something like, to tide you over. That's yeah. my favorite one. Yeah. I I wish I had seen that as a kid. It would have rightfully fucked me up. Um, <laughs> Halloween three is another one that I watched repeatedly on cable. I mean obviously we're repping it today. Yeah. Um not meant for kids, but it was something it always piqued my fascination where I'm like, wait, there's a Halloween movie without michael myers and it's like this i have reading up how it's like it's supposed to be the start of it, this anthology series for the franchise and blah 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 and growing up and being like why the fuck didn't they do it they fucked up so bad and it's such a perfect movie yep. um technically yeah. michael myers is in the film on tv because you're right right him. yeah but like yeah, yeah. i, I I I really got sick and tired of like the argument of like oh well Halloween three is not even Halloween because it doesn't have Michael Myers like it's such a meathead ass response like don't get me wrong like the character Michael Myers is cool but that's not what it was initially supposed to be I don't even think Halloween two was like uh, something that they really wanted to push out Mm -hmm. I I don't know yeah Halloween three it's starting to get love and it makes me really happy I know (laughs) me too me too Um, um. Oh, so I did keep some off my list because they were rated R and I was trying to keep it kid friendly. But what I did watch religiously when I was a kid and actually got dethroned as my favorite zombie film of all time, uh, the original George Merrill, uh, Dawn of the Dead. I fucking loved it. That was my favorite zombie movie for many, many, many years. Day of the Dead was yeah. literally neck and neck and i feel like that movie always gets shunned because any anytime yeah. somebody brings it up like oh dude that sucks compared to dawn and night no. honestly now that i've rewatched it again as an adult i would put day of the De- day of the dead dawn of the dead and the night mm-hmm. living dead like that's my order yeah. um but yeah like those early 
they're not kids friendly at all, but man, they're so like cheesy. Like yeah, when I was a kid watching that, I knew like this isn't real. Like nobody's walking around <laughs> green and like fucking whatever. But um, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Never know. <laughs> COVID, you know. Fucking yeah, yeah. Give it a couple yeah. years and we'll see what that really happens. Absolutely. That was Damn. one of mine. My honorable yeah. mentions as well. But, Day of the Dead's my favorite Romero movie, actually. Uh, over time, like the the Tom Savini aspect of it too, is like God. The fucking the scene where they're like, uh, opening the body of the zombie is one of my favorite practical effects ever put mm-hmm. to film. Too reaches out and everything yeah. falls out. It looks so good. Yeah, it looks incredible. Uh, and then uh, like having an, an uh, for the first time ever an uh, an iconic zombie character now you could say like the buddha zombie or whatnot from mm-hmm. uh, the, the hari mm-hmm. krishna zombie from dawn the dead and whatnot like okay that's fine that's but good. now you have like a legitimate yeah bub you have a legitimate character that is a zombie has zero words does all sorts of emotions such a fucking fantastic character mm-hmm. yeah i actually have his toy right in there <laughs> <laughs> i just love that yeah um, i uh i know i've said this before uh i think in the discord but yeah, last year I met Howard Sherman, who played Bub, um, at the like Romero convention in England, and um, it was like he was there, and he's like this like older man now, and he was like telling us he's like, oh, like I didn't think anyone was like really gonna come and show up like at my table or like want to take pictures or autographs, and you could tell he was so kind of just like shy and like awkward, mm-hmm. and I literally was like, I've literally thrown flown from new orleans to meet you like i was so happy like to meet him and that's the only reason like i mean the whole convention was cool but uh, it was like just highlight of my year meeting him (laughs) did he do a did he do a bub photo op yeah um he wasn't in bub like get up but it had like a background like i had the headphones on and he held like the phone um but yeah he was just in his normal clothes i think texas frightmare weekend if i'm not mistaken they they had him there one year and he did full-blown bub get up like photo ops and i i wow kick myself thinking about not going to that man. not going to that and not going to the horror hound where jamie lee curtis was there like those are the oh two man i regret not going to we and i, I just want to tell her how much i love prom night and <laughs> things that things that she doesn't hear every day yeah um Damn. i want to ask you about carpenter like what did you say to the man and how was that interaction when you met him so i went to go see him whenever he was doing his like tour of playing all of his music and stuff like that and i thought it was just going to be you know, him with his keyboard and like a, a smaller thing mm-hmm. um my girlfriend at the time had bought me tickets and then we had broken up and I was like, well, fuck, I'm not going to be able to go. And she actually transferred it into my name. So that day I get there, I'm second in line. I'm hours early. I get told that I have to go stand in the back of the line because I didn't get my ticket printed out. Right. So I had to go all the way back downstairs, get it. I'm waiting there. Uh, Robert Rodriguez walks in behind me. I'm like, well, this is kind of cool. And like the whole time I could just think of like, fuck, what am I going to say to this man? Like, what am I going to say to John Carpenter that hasn't been said already? And I never had met him before. And I always heard he was kind of a grouch, especially if the Lakers are playing. Cause that's his, that's his team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm standing there and I have my fog vinyl in my hand and I'm like, and my they live poster and my like, dude, I don't know what to say. And whenever I, I had something in my head and as soon as I stood in front of him, the only thing I can say was thank you for raising me. Like nothing else <laughs> came out. I couldn't say anything else. That's not what I wanted to say either. That's just what came out. And he was like, right on man. And like, you know, he was super nice, short interaction, but he's very nice. I asked him, can I take a photo? He's like, get on down here. And like the, <laughs> the sweetest person ever, like all the, all the horror stories I ever heard from about him completely not, that, that was not my situation. And then I just went to the bathroom and I cried a little bit because I'm like, uh-huh. fuck you. Like, like, like he, he definitely was one of the biggest factors of me growing up and getting into horror. And then, you know, at that time I, I worked at sprint. I was just a sales rep. You know, I would not making a whole lot of money or whatnot. And I sit down and I'm front row center directly in front of him, surrounded by all these other people. And like, I'm hearing chatter from, oh, I'm a president of Google IT and all this other stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> just some random ass dude sitting here and I'm watching him. And it was him, 
uh, I think it was his son-in-law and somebody else. They had a big ass screen behind, and every time they'd play uh, something, they would have like videos in the background for yeah. the fog. They had smoke machines and stuff for they live. He put on bu- uh, sunglasses and chewed on bubble gum, and like just to see him play the soundtrack to my childhood, like live for me in person. Uh, one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my entire mm-hmm. life. Like, oh my god, the fact that he's older now uh you know i i I get it everybody dies but that's definitely going to be one of the ones that hits me hard it's gonna wreck me yeah yeah like music wise i love i i think he's one of the best like uh composers in horror i'm glad that he did music for his own movies um I know whenever he dies, whenever Robert Smith dies, and whenever Morrissey dies, like I'm just going to be a wreck. I'm not going to be able to talk to anybody. <laughs> um, and then from a filmmaker standpoint, yeah, whenever he dies, like, man, I've met a lot of people that have been in his films. Like I met Roddy Roddy Piper. Unfortunately, he passed away shortly yeah. after meeting him. Uh, Meg Foster, peace. Keith David. I met a lot of these people, but uh, when he dies, like I. I kind of feel like i probably won't be the same Mm -hmm. and that's he you know the last thing he directed was the ward and i know he's got like a tv show coming out whatever but like you know the ward wasn't good but it doesn't matter there's always that hope that maybe he'll be able to direct another movie just like john waters apparently is directing another movie oh please i can't fucking Mm -hmm. i want to see what that looks like in 2023 like i know i'm very intrigued because John mm-hmm. Waters is another one. When when he goes, I'm not going to be the same person. Like, Life will be man. different for all of us when John Waters sadly leaves us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I couldn't think of anything else to say other than no, thank was, you for raising me. <laughs> that was great. No, it's an amazing story. Um, I love that I like you. Th- you go, go ahead. ahead. I'll say real quick. I love that you threw Morrissey and Robert Smith in there. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> they're just uh, from a musical standpoint, they're mm-hmm. just as big to me as as Carpenter is or yeah, anybody else. Like their music mm-hmm. definitely shaped me as the person I am today and got me through many of dark times. Yeah, and I feel like we all have like that horror icon who really shaped who we are were and stuff. Like I yeah. know for me personally, it's Jennifer Tilly and the Bride <sighs> of Chucky. <laughs> Didn't get to share it earlier, but my favorite childhood Halloween costume was the Bride of Chucky when I was love that. Mm-hmm. That's so it red. That's so it iconic. It yeah. was like a village coming together to create this costume for me. I had my cousin's <laughs> combat boots, my aunt's um, fucking flower girl dress that she had her daughter wear and um my mom pieced together a like beautiful blonde curly haired wig and then we all stuffed my bra out to the nines <laughs> did, you draw, did you draw the heart with tiffany on it i didn't my boobs weren't out so i couldn't because <laughs> i was 11 but you know hey wow. that's so that. rad though that's great yeah she and i was song. chucky for halloween too hey. really oh yeah it works with your hair too Mm. it's perfect uh for me for like a filmmaker that's a horror director that's gonna really affect me when he passes is probably gonna be david cronenberg mostly um it's a hot take for uh, somebody in here (laughs) uh, that's fine um but he's like next to carpenter he was the one that really just like like blew my head open you know seeing the fly for the thing and the video drum for the first time was like very monumental for me and like just hearing him talk about film and kind of reflecting on his career and and horror in general like i think he's just so chill and just just kind of at peace with it at this day and age as odd as that sounds from cronenberg but um his presence as a filmmaker just really calms me for some reason so even as an actor, like you're wearing a Nightbreed shirt, yeah, his portrayal of Doctor yeah. Decker is so fucking iconic, an insanely good, you know, director turned actor performance that I just love. Um, Clive Barker is another person that I was huge for me when I, you yeah. know, was just getting into horror. So there, again, we could go on, but um, I guess one final thing I want to wrap this up with is, is a question for all of you guys, which is kind of the inverse of what we did. But like, what's one movie that you saw too young that you would never show your child or a child? Um, and I already said Halloween too, so I'm just gonna say that's my answer. But I'm really curious to like what y'all, you know, what fucked you up and what would you not want to pass down to 
to a child. <laughs> That's I mean, a good I question. saw The Bride of Chucky when I was like four or five. <laughs> um, way too young. Yeah. I love that movie. Um, and what did you would say? Right yeah. Made me the woman I am today. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, I think um, mine I I, was... Sorry, continue. Um, it is the one that I absolutely would not show my child, though, because that but, scarred me. The Tim Curry one? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that one's a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't either. What about you guys? Uh, a Nightmare on Elm Street for me. Um, I mean, that movie's just pure genius anyway. It's like dreaming about the antagonist, and then he comes to life. Like, you show any kid mm. that, and they're fucked, so... They won't sleep that night. Yeah. yeah. There's no way. Yeah. Definitely agree. Like, I, I, I would definitely put, I'm, I'm looking at like all the, my autographs here. I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, uh, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all this other stuff. Yeah. But like, <laughs> whenever I was a kid and I saw Reanimator for the first time, like I was maybe like five years old, six years old. And seeing a scene where a dude is holding his own severed head and he's putting it between a woman's legs uh kind of did something for me that i definitely don't think that i would want my son to watch that until he got a little older like that scene and then texas chainsaw 2 with leatherface like you know uh and stretch yeah i don't even have to continue with that like you already know what i'm talking about (laughs) but yeah i think reanimator um specifically just for some of that stuff although like some of the some of the the taglines like cat's dead details later and stuff like that is I say it all the time already, so but or the shining. I, I don't think I'd probably show my kid the shining. Just mm. when I was a kid and I saw that and the scene of like the little girls butchered in the hallway, like oh my mm. god. Terrified me. Yeah. That's another mm. one I saw too young, I think, as well. I feel like this list has really just been us learning about what helped Ant Man through puberty. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole episode. <laughs> Oh, a spin-off, yeah. a spin-off episode. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Shining may have helped with that a little bit too. <laughs> what the the bear scene? The bear boy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, the bear scene. You're like, yes. I love furry stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, well that was great. That was I, I had a great time shooting the shit with you guys. It was a really it gave me a lot of homework too. I can't wait to watch some of the things that were mentioned here that I haven't seen. Um, and yeah, a happy, happy October. I can't wait to watch, you know, r- adult horror themed movies too. Mm-hmm. I got to say, but yeah, I, I love the whole theme that Char- that you came up with Charlotte. So thank you for coming up with it, obviously. And we'll have to do more uh, kids themed episodes. I, I love the Christmas one too. So We'll keep that in mind. Um, and of course, Ant-Man and Rigby, thank you so much for for making your first appearance on the pod. You guys are welcome back anytime. And yeah, thank you for bringing all the knowledge and and the laughs and everything. So do you guys have anything you want to like plug your letterbox or anything? Or You don't have to. Just, just a podcast sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I'm debating mean, about doing a series on kids horror on my TikTok, which I <sighs> send you a link to. So please. plug it, yeah, yeah. I that that sounds amazing. I'd love to see that. Yeah, this. Uh, thanks for having us on. It was a blast. Anytime I get to talk about horror, I get really excited. So uh, this was definitely a treat for me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks Likewise. so much, Jake. It was fun because so I know. We don't get to do this often. I know. Yeah. It's it's always a treat for me too, just to unload all of my nerdum and shit out with it with all you guys. So it's always a pleasure. So thank you guys. And if you ever have an idea, just hit me back and we'll we'll do an episode about it. I'm always open. So Hell yeah. anyway, thank you listeners. Thank you for listening. Um subscribe to our podcast feed and all that good stuff. Instagram. We have a website where we do some blog stuff and I'll you know, check out the YouTube. Um, and it's October, so we're gonna have a lot of poor themed episodes, which is honestly like my favorite things to talk about. So I'm very excited to do more episodes about that. Um, and have a great October. Um, that's all I got. Bye. <laughs>